Oh, hello? Oh. I'm good. Alright. How do I close the preview if I have Twitch open? Do I just have to close the Twitch page? What? I popped out the chat. Oh yeah, you can close it after that. That's it. Okay, are you watching via Twitch? Is it on Twitch? I'll have everything on streaming? Twitch. I mean, I don't know where else to put it. Discord streaming service is nice, but like... Yeah, camera you know, code stuff. You have to put everyone, okay, everyone yeah, together. Uh... Oh, you were talking to Elto. Oh, no, no, I wasn't talking to Elto. Oh. Hey, the bully-free zone. Also, I posted it in a bunch of different places, so it'd be weird to like... Try to get everyone in one uh, place. Oh, yeah, in there, yeah, yeah. We got, I think, 14 entries. 13 or 14. 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14! Exciting. Elto's here to protest this. I try Elto, believe me. No, there's no stopping me. Yeah, I remember you're a mod. You kicked you kicked someone, and then they they threw a fit over it. I forget why. It, what it was during one of the B minus twenties, I think. What? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think they did. <laughs> They're having a whack opinion. So tomorrow I'll let you choose like what to read first. Go get your thing done. Also, this baller track was made by Damara. I don't know if you can hear it. Right, the track? Damara. I commissioned him nice. to make like a pending whatever, you know? Okay. Yeah. Intermission music. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I don't think he ever put it on Patreon, which is a shame because it's a really good track. But it's mine. Mine for me. <laughs> wow. If you take away your $5, I'm putting $5 in. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go do the deed. Alright, hurry up. <laughs> We're just uh, waiting for Damar to get ready. Isn't it sick? It's fucking sick.
Damn it, the bar. Bar, hurry up! Alright, let's see ya. Not sure what to read first, or what order to go in. I don't want to go through top down, because that's boring. I'll let Damar pick when he gets here. Damar. Once he gets back, we could uh, pick one and start. Princess of the Coom. <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's the some fucking names here. Yeah, right? Alright, you ready, Damar? Yep. Alright, so, remember, contest is write something interesting, at least 500 words. No upper limit. Um, whoever's the most interesting wins a thousand USD. Okay, so, Damar, which one do you want to go through first? I have everyone's like the entrance name and then a slash. Okay, either fresh or Ishii first, or fish. Fresh, Ishii, or fish. Yeah, those, just the titles sound interesting, right? Pick one. Uh, okay, it's gonna be uh, fresh. All right, fresh. Close this. Put this window aside. All oh, right. Jesus Christ. What? <laughs> oh God, okay, this is pretty long. What? No, no, no. I was reading the dialogue and I thought it was like. Uh... Never mind. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay, like a porn fanfic or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's slowly increasing. All right, ready? So this is yeah, the experiment on. by Fresh, who's from the Himehina server I'm in. All right. Heat slowly increasing. Nice. Absorption 530 nanometers increasing. Nautical 400 miles. nanometers. Huh? Nautical, Nautical miles? miles? Oh, shit. Okay. Increasing at equal rates. Excellent. Adding more sodium bisulfate. The bisulfite. Fight. Good, good. This is going to be it, I tell you. This is the furthest we have gotten so far. I assured Lee as we both started stared at the changing numbers on the computer screen. Uh, I don't know. You said it yourself. This is the furthest we've gotten. All this is pretty much uncharted territory, so there's not a lot. There's a lot that could go wrong even now, he replied with an uncertain look on his face. We continued observing the changing numbers while the photometer's deep buzzing noise was drowning out the distant cars passing by on the street a few ten meters away from us. And it's gone again, Lee said as the numbers swiftly returned to their original values. I told you it wouldn't work again. We can't give up now that we are so close to something amazing. Just imagine all the money we're going to make. You and me, buddy. Oh, you're going to be a renowned scientist, of course. I couldn't have Lee give up now. He was making great progress so far, but because of his downer mentality, he couldn't believe that this research would lead to anything. Fucking emo kids, dude. Huh? I said fucking emo kids. What? Oh, downer? Yeah. I guess. As I looked around the worn down shed we were in, I started reminiscing about the five months of research that have led us to this day. Sure, effectively we haven't made pro any progress to date. We still haven't reached our desired goal, so why... So I get why Lee would want to give up. But we were getting closer every day. I had this feeling that today was going to be it. The day we finally made a breakthrough. Hmm. How about we go to Ava's Cafe and catch a break for now? Being all down like this will only make us unproductive, I suggested. Actually, Lee was the one who was down and unmotivated. I was motivated and positive as usual, but because he was so stubborn, he would not have, never have taken a break from working on it, no matter how exhausted he was. Lee was actually... The one doing all the work. 
was just there to keep him working and I guess motivated. Oh fuck, I don't know how to read that word. Uh, as we left the shed, the bright noon sun beaming down on us was blindingly bright. It must have been a whole day since we last left our dimly lit research hideaway, so it took our eyes a while to adjust to the outside. With partially impaired vision, we made our way toward the road, which was only a short walk away. Once we stepped on the adjacent pavement, there was only a few more minutes down the street to the cafe where we usually went called Le Croulement. Uh, Le Croulement. I don't know. Uh, the cafe was about as big as our little shed and largely overshadowed by the coffee shop. That was a big part of the chain. That was part of a big chain, situated across the street, so only two customers were sitting at one of the tables on the front when we arrived. In search of the owner, we entered the cafe through its open front. Inside there were three tables made of black painted metal and dark wood like the ones out front. The interior had a lot of different kinds of asymmetrically arranged potted plants, and generally consisted of a lot of different types of wood. The choice of wood didn't seem to follow any kind of pattern, and rather looked like it was picked at random. The inside was mostly lit by the sun shining through one of the several windows. The combination of all this gave the place a really cozy atmosphere. Oh hey there guys, taking a break from work? What can I get ya? We did us the owner of the cafe, Ava. Yeah, we've been working through the night again without any success, so we thought we could really use a break before getting back into it. I'll take the usual, I replied. Same. Muttered Lee before walking off to sit down at the table furthest away from any other outside the cafe and immediately began browsing his phone. Okay, uh, double espresso and green tea coming right up, I exclaimed before getting to work on our order. After putting on the kettle for Lee's tea, Eva looked up to me with a smug on her face and asked, What happened to the big breakthrough you promised last week? Before grounding the coffee beans for my coffee. Hey, don't look- don't give me that look. We were so close. Even more so even now. Uh, it's just a matter of days, no, hours. I tell you, as soon as we get back, the temp will be it. Confident as ever, I see, Ava laughed. If you're right though, don't forget to remember who made you all that delicious tea and coffee. Of course I'm right, I have a good feeling about today. Better make sure you have enough coffee for an adequate celebration. All this talk would sound way more impressive if you didn't say the exact same thing at least twice a week. How about we talk more after I bring you guys your drinks? Sure, I said while heading to the table where Lee was sitting. There was three chairs at the table and Lee took the only one that was uh, protected from direct sunlight by the awning directly above it. I ended up having to sit where the hot sun was constantly beaming down on me. It was a surprisingly warm day for September, at least in the sun it definitely was. Soon after I sat down, Eva already arrived with our drinks including the latte macchiato, presumably for herself. She handed us our drinks and sat down on the empty chair next to us. Staring at your phone like this makes you only look even more depressed than usual. Virgil always told me that you guys' research wasn't going that well, so I guess I could understand, Eva said, forcing a smile. He looked up as slightly and muttered, I don't quite remember the last time I slept, before letting out a loud inhaling yawn followed by a long exhale out of his nose. Jeez. I didn't think it was that bad. You really are too stubborn for your own good. You should rest more. You should probably have slept more... Slept rather than coming here. Don't worry. He just needs his tea, and then he's good to go. Sleep is for the week anyways. I exclaimed as Lee's table hit the... <laughs> Lee's head hit the table. Or not. Oh gosh, are you okay? Ava asked worryingly, jumping from her chair. Although her question was immediately answered by Lee snoring. Ava let, us, let out a sigh, sat back down and said, Well, I guess you're going to be here for a while. And so we were. By the time we woke up, the sun was already setting. We went on our way to the shed in order to continue working on our research. It was much colder outside now that the sun was lower, so the warm outdoors that would have bothered us earlier were now more than welcome. As we began setting up the next experiment, I opened up the document and started noting down the current time. It was 6.51pm, so we must have been outside for about 6 hours. But it definitely didn't feel like that, talking to Ava. Midway through setting up, Lee stopped and put his tools down. He looked at me with a worried look on his face and whispered under his breath, Hey, on our way back I kind of thought about stuff. Maybe we should just give up, and I swear this isn't me being pessimistic as usual. We've been working on this for months now, and luckily nothing has gone wrong yet. I just... He had red his eyes. Well, what is it? I asked. What if there's something goes wrong? We don't know how our research will end. 
What if something unexpected happens and we die? Everything would be for nothing. He looked at me back. He looked back at me with tears in his eyes. Why are you suddenly scared of doing the experiment? It's if nothing has ever gone wrong, then why should it now? You tested ways of stopping it in case the reaction ends up being stronger than expected. We shouldn't have anything to worry about as long as we are careful. It's just when I sleep at the, when I fell asleep at the cafe, I had a dream about the experiment. Yeah, in the dream, we finally succeeded. He began. That'd be a good omen, wouldn't it? He continued. But something went wrong. I don't remember what, but I heard you scream in pain and everything faded to black and my dream ended. I tried to console him by patting him on the shoulder. It's just a dream. Don't worry, we got this. Nothing will go wrong. But what if? For the first time ever, I could actually sense him being really scared about something. How about we give it one last try? And if it doesn't work, we will work on something else. I take full responsibility. I can guarantee you that the both of us will make will walk out of here tomorrow to grab another drink at Ava's cafe. I promise. I forced a smile to make Lee feel at ease. Lee wiped away his tears. Okay, I trust you, Virgil. Lee and Virgil. Uh, with less of a forced smile, I struck a pose and said, Well, let us do this. Well then, let us do this. Lee continued setting up the experiment as I watched. Leaving all of this behind after one last try felt odd. We've been working on it for almost half a year now, and conducting these experiments with Lee quickly became part of my daily routine. It was as if this was going to be our last try. We had to make it count. Okay, all set, Lee said as he put down the Erlenmeyer flask. Are you ready? Yeah, let's start. I turned on the photometer and heated the magne magnetic stir and set it to 33 degrees Celsius. One degree more than our attempts prior. Lee looked at the magnetic stir's display and immediately afterwards at me, but he didn't say anything about the unusual temperature setting. It would have been unlike him for him not to notice the discrepancy to our other attempts, so I assume he kept his mouth shut as if this was only as as this was going to be our last attempt anyways. Lastly, Lee inserted the photometer's probe and with that the last experiment was a go. Okay. I wonder what the experiment is exactly. Opening the barrette, Lee began. Heat slowly increasing, Lee continued. Okay. Absorption 530. What was this? Nanometers? Nanometers, yeah. Nanometers, okay. Absorption 530 nanometers increasing, 400 nanometers decreasing at equal rate. Same as usual. All right. Adding so more sodium bisulfate. Good. It didn't look like anything different was going to happen, even though I changed the temperature by one degree in such a delicate chemical reaction. We had to do something different, otherwise our last experiment would end the same way as any other. How about we add more bisulfate as usual? Double the usual amount sounds good. <laughs> Double. Sure, your call. We so had to delete. Send it. <laughs> Just put it all in. Okay, uh, we hesitantly did as I said, and it only took a few seconds before I would regret my decision. The connection started boiling and bubbling vigorously at, to the point of overflowing. The liquid was giving off a blinding white glow, filling the usually lit, dimly lit shed with light. The numbers on the computer from the probe were rising quick, very quickly compared to any other time. Tiny sparks were forming inside the flask, producing loud zapping noises. What the fuck? What's happening? Leah jumped up from his chair and was shouting in absolute terror. It took me a few seconds to grasp the gravity of the situation we were in. My blood started rushing to my head and I began sweating intensely. I didn't know whether it was due to the panic or if the liquid had heated up the room by that much, but I started feeling extremely hot, like I'd had some kind of 40 degree fever. Pretty sure that would kill you. 37 degrees Celsius is like... You have a fever, or I think 38. 40 degree would be like, yeah, you're dead. You'd like, fire inside. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I began feeling nauseous and about to pass out, but I remembered that I had promised Lee to take full responsibility for this experiment, but I couldn't come up with any way of stopping this. I had a feeling that this turn of events would eventually lead to catastrophe. But it just struck me. Despite everything that was on my mind, and I somehow managed to remember that Lee had come up with a way of stopping the reaction in case of an emergency a couple of weeks back. Lee was staring at the flask, completely frozen up, so I sprang up from my chair and shook him out of it and said, Lee, we gotta do something. How do we stop the reaction? Quick! Completely taken by surprise, Lee started, uh, acid. We need some kind of acid. There should be enough right here. Next to... Uh, Lee looked at an open, empty, tipped-over bottle next to the entrance. How did... Don't tell me that was the only one we... the only acid we had. They're gonna throw tea in it. 
Lee just stared at me without saying a word. At this point, I felt like time had slowed down a whole bunch. Maybe that was just the adrenaline rushing to my head, but maybe it had something to do with the experiment going wrong. Either way, I had no time to be thinking about it. I packed Lee by the shoulders and shouted, Quick, fuck, there has to be another way. You think, dammit. Th there is no other way. Wait, any type of acid would do. Hydrochloric acid would do. Lee stammered. <laughs> Tell me where, quick. Stomach acid. We have to drink it. <laughs> Time seemed to move even slower. We have to drink it. That's what he said. That's insane, but... Oh, shit. It had to be me. I promised Lee that I would take full responsibility for this. I was the one who suggested... Who increased the heat. I was the one who suggested more bisulfate. I was the one who suggested one last try. I, I had to drink it. I let go of Lee and quickly grabbed the now burning hot flask. Teary eyed, I looked at Lee for one last time and he said with a shaken voice, I'm sorry. Farewell, my friend. I poured the concoction, concoction down my throat. My body instantly felt like it was burning the ashes from the inside out. My lungs were completely drained of air and was about as tight as if they had collapsed. I could feel making my way down the, my esophagus while my vision was increasingly getting blurrier and fading to white. Hearing two last loud pounds. Nothing. Nothing. I felt nothing. But they say your life or they say your life flashes before your eyes when you're about to die, but nothing of the sorts happened to me. The only image of Lee's fully fully in tears reaching out to me was burned into my mind. I couldn't even stop thinking about if my actions actually managed to save his life. Thinking. Could I even think in the timeless state of death? But as I, but as I was about to accept my eternal state of thinking about the last moments before my death, the feeling of nothingness started to subside. The feeling of my insides burning started returning. My lungs felt dry and so did my whole body. A constant deafening, deafening ringing started making its way into my way toward my unconscious mind. I felt the sensation of being pierced by a thousand needles all over my body, each of them piercing deeper than the one before. The loud ringing was soon drowned out by a different sound I couldn't identify. Rain? I felt my dry lips move. This shouldn't have been possible. I died, right? The pain grew stronger and, and the sound of rain in my ears grew louder. The pure white I had been seeing earlier faded into a soft black. A sudden strong pressure in and around my head added to the pain I felt prior. Out of instinct, I reached my right hand toward my head. The sensation I felt before reaching it was that of a long, sturdy object. I felt my eyelids twitch, so I placed another hand on the object as well and tried moving it off my head. Millimeter by millimeter, I moved the object under immense pain. I felt, my face felt like it was about to be scraped by a cheese grater. The muscles in my arms felt like they were balloons about to burst and my hands felt like they were touching liquid nitrogen. Actually, my whole body was suddenly freezing cold on the outside, yet burning hot on the inside. The dryness of my body got battled by a wet sensation caused by the needles piercing me. As the object I was pushing away from my face reached the halfway mark, I s suddenly started tipping, tipping and completely fell off my face. Um, my eyes blinked profusely as the dim moonlight shined through the rain clouds hit my cornea. The sound of the rain hitting the ground around me rain drowned out every other second and I could hardly hear my own thoughts. I grasped for air on the surface of my body suddenly... I grasped for air as the pain on my surface of my body suddenly disappeared. The short and shallow breaths on my lungs started feeling with humid air. The coldness I was only feeling on the outside filled my lungs and slowly began spreading throughout my whole body. I didn't know how long I was lying here. Time meant little to nothing after I had get after all had that had happened. My mind was completely blank and my body adjusted to being alive. Suddenly Lee came to mind and I worried about his well-being. I sprung, sprung up and shouted his name, but what my eyes saw was nothing but total ruin. All around me were singed pieces of wood. The trees that should have been next to the shed were mostly burned down and the grass that was supposed to have a darkish green color was for the most part either completely gone or burned to an ashy black. Nothing looked the way I remembered it to be. Still feeling really unwell, I searched in the debris in the hopes of finding Lee. In the corner of my eye, I noticed a large pile of wood capable of completely burying a person as small as Lee alive. I quickly rushed over toward him, again digging through it. At the bottom of it, I found human remains. The only thing that was left of him were bones. My closest friend, the one I had been working with side by side for months, dead. Because of me, because of my mistakes, because of the promise I couldn't keep, because I suggested one last attempt of the experiment. I tried saving him by drinking the chemical and sacrificing myself. So why was I alive? Why couldn't it have been him? Am I just pretendingly 
pretend playing unjustifiably confident good for nothing and he is an extremely talented genius. I should have died. I should just kill myself. I let out another scream, even louder than the one before, but that didn't change anything. He was dead, I was alive. That much was fact. I wanted to cry, but I physically couldn't even shed a tear. As I looked down in despair, I noticed most of my clothes had been burned off, except for the one piece of cloth conveniently covered my groin area all the way around. The rest of my body was completely singed and burned red. I stood there without moving an inch. Ava! I decided to go to the only person I had left. Ava. Ava, Ava. By the time I went on my way to the cafe, the sun had already risen. It must have been around 7pm, the time Ava usually gets everything ready for business. I didn't know what to do all by myself, so I had to talk to her about what happened. She had always been so cheery, and I just needed someone like her in my moment of utter despair. She's the only one I had left. On the way there, countless pedestrians on their way to work I walked past gave me funny looks. But who could have barely blamed them, seeing an almost naked, singed freak like me? Upon arrival, I noticed the storefront was already open, but I couldn't see Ava anywhere. I went inside to look for her everywhere. I checked around the building, in her storage room, and even the woman's bathroom. I desperately needed to talk to her, but I still couldn't find her. I looked at the clock hung back on the wall which read 8.24. I figured she must have gone somewhere. I wasn't uncomfortable I wasn't comfortable waiting inside, so I sat down on the chained down chair in front of the cafe that was under the awning because it was the only one not wet from the rain. It was the same chair Lee was sitting less than a day ago. Time went by and she didn't return. The clock now read 12.49. Looking at the inside of the cafe once more, it looked rather messy. There were a bunch of wet leaves scattered on the wooden floor next to the entrance. In general, wooden floors, wooden floorboards looked really wet. A lot of equipment inside was plugged in and the chairs weren't as neatly organized as the start of the day usually. Waiting for her for god knows how long didn't help. I was getting more and more desperate by the minute. I decided to head to her apartment which was positioned right above the cafe in hopes of finding her there. I headed up the stairs. One of the door knocked and waited and knocked and waited again. Nothing. Ava didn't respond. I couldn't take waiting anymore, so I climbed up the pipe and behind the ca behind the cafe to her window. It wasn't locked, so I slid it open and climbed inside. What the hell? He's just breaking and entering. Uh, once again, I searched everywhere, shouting her name while doing so. Once again, she was nowhere to be found. Near the entrance, next to the entrance door, one pair of her shoes, only her. Her only coat and her keys were missing. The only thing left behind, my surprise, was her phone. In the hopes of it giving me a clue to her whereabouts, I picked up her phone and typed in the code 4473. I remember seeing it, seeing her put it in a couple of years back. Luckily, she still used the same one. As soon as I got past the lock screen, I was greeted by WhatsApp. I opened the chat. Was a group chat between Lee, Ava, and I. In it were messages I hadn't seen yet. They read, "Drop it by two to bring you some coffee and tea. Be there by ten. See you then." Huh. Uh, the timestamp on those messages were just shortly after we had arrived to the shed to work on the experiment. Suddenly, it struck me. The two loud pounds right before the disaster went down. Was that her? The timing definitely fits and it was the same as the stupidly simple, stupidly simple secret knocking pattern we had made up when we were all still in an elementary school. Could that really have been her? She always knocked on her shed, just like what I heard yesterday. I sank down on her couch in her apartment and waited as despair destroyed every spark of hope I had left. She didn't come back. <laughs> I grabbed her gun, hidden away in the leftmost cupboard in her kitchen, and rushed over to the shed. The fuck? Uh, I continued rummaging through all the remains of the piles of debris until I came across a site I had already anticipated but utterly feared all at the same time. A completely singed body, burned to a crisp without partially exposing bones. I pulled the body from the debris pile. It was Ava. I listened for a heartbeat. She's like a piece of charcoal now. I listened for a heartbeat, but the only thing I could hear was the loud sound of rain hitting the ground and the calamitous thunder. She was dead. She is dead. They are both dead. I hold up the gun to my head, pull the trigger, put my hand on the finger on the trigger, and with one last thunderous bang, I pull Brilliant the trigger. <laughs> what was it? He drank the thing. How did he live? That's funny. Damn. What do you think the experiment was, Damar? No fucking idea, honestly. I wonder what the uh, anagram alle allegory was supposed to be. I thought it'd be like... I don't know. They'd get superpowers or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Interesting. Okay. What do you think, Damar? Stuff. I'm pretty sure. That's huh? pretty interesting. I, I thought it was pretty. I good. thought I thought it was definitely gonna get like whammoed and be like, "Oh, it's a cowboy or some stuff." Yeah, <laughs> that was actually like surprisingly like, yeah, sober. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was actually kind of depressing. I think it was very well written. Like it felt natural. Didn't cool. Uh, I feel like the progression was natural, but like the, what is it? It's a little strange that he didn't notice the second body there, I think. What do you mean? I think, yeah, I think there was a lot of tension there. No, like, he's, he's, he went to the shed, right? And then there was, um... He, he found uh, his partner, Lee. I think this part is funny. We have to drink it. We have... I, it reminds me of, um... Reservoir Dogs, you know what I mean? Where the main thing is not the focus of attention, it's everything yeah, around it. Everything you know? going on like what was. exactly the experiment was did not matter in the slightest. Like in Reservoir Dogs, you know, the actual bank robbery oh, is like never matter. shown. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Damar, say something real quick. Let me put up your volume a bit. Alright, there we go. Alright, interesting. Good job, Fresh. Do you want to read the next one? That was a lot. Yeah, sure. Alright, cool. Uh, you want to send me the file so I don't have to like read it off your stream? Uh, sure. Let's see, send message. Which one do you want to read? Um, I want to read Cahoots. Cahoots? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Oh god, this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> All right. Ready? Wait, wait, wait. Yep. I mean, is this hard to read? <laughs> is this hard to see? Who are you asking me or stream? Uh, you and stream, I guess. I'm I not looking at it fine. I'm trying to Whatever. just copy the doc into it. Just read it off uh, text thing. It kind of cuts it off. I don't have too much to remember. Holy shit. Oh, it's not that bad. Okay. All right. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Zoom. That one was long, but I think it, it, it felt natural, right? And I was like, what the fuck is going to happen? So, I think that was interesting. Pretty good, Fresh. Pretty good. Alright. Alright, Damar. Alright. Um, so this one was by Cahoots. Uh, it's titled... Th I don't know if it's titled Ted Kaczynski or Living in the John Bowman, but it opens with <laughs> Ted Kaczynski. The necessity of authentic living. Oh, okay, I see. I get it. I get it. I'm oh, fucking wait, hold on. Let me is this, so this is a, I think this is a Ted Kaczynski quote. Oh. So... The necessity of authentic living, even if that authenticity comes at the price of deluding yourself of any potential consequences in the moment and time thereafter, otherwise titled living freely and automatically, or for our Canadian friends, living in the John Bowman. <laughs> An introductory explanation and exploration piece to a lifestyle. This short piece is dedicated to my good friend, Mr. John, I fucked your mom XD Bo who I once said on the day after Christmas that the two of us shared a bond like that I wish a pedophile would wish they could share with a child. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes he lives free and sometimes he doesn't, but all motions are authentic, and so I have named this after him in deference. You might ask firstly, what, what does you mean by the title and everything that came after that? I wasn't paying that much attention. And I will answer that. I can't explain, and you will not comprehend, but it's okay. I can type a lot, and you can learn the buzzwords. Yeah, nice. That's the important part. Um, you only need to ever read 20% of a book to understand 80% of its contents. That's an ancient rule an Italian came up with, and it's stuck ever since. Oh, I need some water. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was 12 years old, I could read 400 pages in 8 hours and remember like 45% of the content. 
and then fast forward about 10 years, my brain evolved into a fist, and all it does is pretty much punch my skull. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. Firstly, by living in the John Bowman, I don't mean embracing a very cool and close bond despite the vast physical distance that may exist with Mr. Bow. There's a more cool, sublime meaning regarding the term and action of living in the John Bowman. And I'm here to attempt to provide you an easy explanation that may help you in easy living for the future. Anything is possible if you force it enough after all. That's just something that slides along the way. <laughs> Let us first understand the term and then we can talk about the idea behind it and some possible applications to your life, okay? The term living in the John Bowman is an action. An idea that has been attributed to here to Mr. John Bow, hence the name and inherently is the act of living freely and automatically, resides within our subconscious and will likely take the world soon by storm. Living in the John Bowman is the ability to automatically react with your basis reaction, completely absent <laughs> of any external influence. It is the consideration of scales I created in my head after the moment of reading Wikipedia and inventing new measurements, one of my most genuinely authentic methods of living freely that I which can be thought of. I ate a huntsman-sized spider the size of a few fingers at a mate's 18th birthday party. I Michael Jordan up in the air and squatted the cunt out of the air and <laughs> hit my mouth where I chewed on him. He tasted like dirt and acid, and to this day I am recalled by every bloke who went there as a legend. And no man and wo no woman who remembers it looks upon me without a hint of fear in their eyes. That's my John Bowman, without any cocker balls involved. <laughs> okay. Water. There are observable consequences for living in the John Bowman, as can be observed in the Mr. John Bow himself. Such as con such consequences are, for example, poor <laughs> words, poor actions, later regret upon further consideration, <laughs> and being called gay by a large crowd for sending unsolicited pictures of the cock and balls. <laughs> but regardless of any consequences, you reap the rewards of coolness. These are the prices one must pay in absolute development of the authentic self, I say. Like, do you know what it really means to teach someone a lesson? When I was in middle school, I called an autistic kid who had detention for being a shitter, a garbage man, and said he was picking up garbage now, and he'd be picking up garbage for the rest of his life. He had aspirations of being a scientist. And he flung a trash can at me, and we duked it out with various punches and chokeholds, reminiscent of a gachimuchi <laughs> right outside the teacher's office. <laughs> It was inside the after-school detention hangabouts that we reforged a friendship that was twice as strong, and in his company I would be slapped later by a Vietnamese girl for jumping her outside the locker and pulling my eyes to the side while slurring out a quick, me so funny. The autistic kid thought it was hilarious, and so did I. Karmaic retribution would later dictate that I would become friendly with a Filipino woman who was very physical with her friendship, and I would routinely cop a punch in the gut or shoulder that I was not allowed to retaliate to. Such is the price of the universe's cycle and another friend lusting after the world's strongest race. <laughs> I consider it of absolute importance to develop yourself as soon as possible. People who live authentically are often at the peak of their physical, social, and mental health, and those who aren't yet at that peak are soon to reach it, and those who aren't anywhere near any such a peak of the three attributes of human existence are clearly deranged and possibly psychopathic men who could possibly be worshipped by fellow internet schizophrenics. <laughs> so really, there's an opportunity in every venue. If you're not mentally adept enough to take a beating from society's evil tongue, then you will suffer. But there's more to be found in a manifesto. If you're willing to take a risk and live in the John Bowman, then think a thought and take the first think on that thought that comes to mind, and disregarding any consequences that may taint the possibilities later grasp the first thing in mind. The eth that's the essence, essence of authenticity, baby. But you gotta dilute the process later, maybe, to ensure that you can remain in society without restraint. <laughs> We're no longer free to absolute freedom. It's more like a chastity, sissy cage, estrogen type of freedom. <laughs> Only to be let out by a dominatrix known as the government on a whim and occasion. Eat bugs, kick things you don't like, start fights with people you can win against who don't deserve them. <laughs> Ram your head into steel poles <laughs> to prove how tough you are. Talk faster than your tongue can process. Develop a cool and unique identifying trait like a stutter. Abandon things that you like. Ponder how cool being homeless would be. Work the mantra, <laughs> live life, be authentic, hate being a woman, be a dark star. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. 
Okay, thank you for reading. Goodbye. I think by now you've comprehended enough buzzwords to be able to manipulate a new version of living authentically that can be uniquely called yours. I finished this piece by 6 a.m. on a Saturday, ate a schnitzel I defrosted incorrectly, <laughs> microwaved, and then cooked alongside some pseudo gravy on roast veggies. Not that bad. Definitely powered the mind. 18 hours of active strain sets you forward, possibly into Alzheimer's, but that's the cost of greatness in a moment. Want a Dota game. I remembered while writing this that John Bo didn't appreciate the end of Homunculus as much as I did. Fuck you, John Bo. Get a taste of keto, why don't you, bastard? Anyway, Shoshin's better than Shoshin's better than authenticity. I knew a bloke who said in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert's minds there are few, and then he proceeded to develop <laughs> develop schizophrenia. <laughs> and aggressively verbally attack people around him for being unepic. <laughs> Un unstoppable stuff. Good guy all around, honestly. Can play a mean harmonica. I wouldn't be surprised if he was planning to kill someone, though. <laughs> what the that fuck? Was a read. Jesus Christ. That was really funny. Jesus Christ. Our man's cahoots gotta write a book. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Damn, that was that was really good. Was Look at Cahoots, yeah. friend. Wasn't he in the? Didn't he also write in the cyberpunk thing? Cyberpunk, yeah, he also wrote. Yeah, that. Cruz. <laughs> he wrote the Cruz story. Oh my god, this guy is really funny. Very creative. I like that. It's a top contender. It was like coherently incoherent, you know? Yeah. It was just enough. It was just enough, like boarding on the edge of sanity. That was pretty good. You could say it was John Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I kind of want to read something on the shorter side because that one was long, and then you could read Bacon's because his is long. How much? Yeah. All right, which one should I read, Damar? Uh, why don't you let the stream pick? Huh? Why don't you let the stream pick? Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, whoever's watching, vote for what you want to see. Either by title or by the person's name. Anyone? 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 No one's doing anything, Noir. Alto, Ducky. Alto and Ducky, okay. We need a tiebreaker. Duck, alright, Ducky it is. Princess yeah. of the Coom. <laughs> alright, this should be interesting. Oops. Alright, we're here to read your Neko Arc porn. All right. Oh, yeah, I think I follow this person on Twitter. Pretty sure. Who? Ducky? Really... Well, both of them. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Princess of the Coom. A short and a cunny piece by Ducky McDuck. I'm not exactly sure when this side of her first came about, but it definitely took a while getting used to. Looking back, it was something that manifested sporadically. Amplified by the ever-increasing comfort that we find ourselves under whenever we were at each other's presence. It usually came about as a follow-up to all the trouble we managed to get in and out of together. Some sort of play to unwind, and it certainly took some time before I learned to adore it. Particularly, her wine-red eyes often told me a lot of stories about this quaint, ridiculous woman on her own. They always wanted to do a lot of things. Nothing bad from what I could tell, though some of it was absolutely selfish. At times, like currently, it almost felt like her eyes wildly grew, attempting to project over her pale white skin and short blonde hair, beautiful bits that were so orderly a few moments ago and are now blushing and untidied as if belonging to some sort of animalistic creature. If it wasn't, it wasn't as if she turned into a sphinx, the puzzling man-eater mytho with a woman's head, as her coy smile and smooth, smoothened touches suggested something much more smaller. A wide-eyed critter that simply demanded attention from its presence alone. Her legs, often covered by dark thigh-high socks and a long grape-purple skirt, 
are certainly fitting of her grown stature and are quite athletic, all things considered. They definitely felt different whenever she started acting like this. How easily I get to move them and grasp them, despite her apparent their strength and size. Often gives me an impression of two warm handlebars I could end up snapping completely on accident. <laughs> Curiously enough, regarding this perked up state of hers, is that her naturally pronounced chest often attempts to go unnoticed. Her picturesque preference in top clothing, mostly consisting of large white sweaters, is rather apt at concealing her great pale breasts. It is surprisingly difficult to get them off her while she's like this, as she often captures me in my attempts, guiding my arms to reach underneath the curiously braless outfit instead. She'd do this to get me to brush against her smooth stomach, and only and so only my hands get to greet her ma get to meet her sensitive tits. It strategically leaves my eyes to starve, just so they are forced to look back at her increasingly melty face for sustenance. In contrast to the mystique surrounding other bits of this asinine play, her groin often presented itself rather honestly. I can only assume she does plan a bit every ahead every time it happens, as her choice of underwear often seems to be either special for the occasion, dark nylon strings around her hips subtly exposing her pink rows and disappearing in between her buttocks, or missing entirely, exposing her bare bottom as soon as her skirt is disposed of. Of course, all this vulnerability is quickly exploited as punishment for all the previous tomfoolery, with new things being off the table as her slender frame quickly surrenders whatever is left of her control to me. The longer it all goes on, the more of this absurd performance entices us both. Her usually clear voice seems to start roughening, scrambling for words, eventually reduced to short noises and nods of affirmation, simply rolling off as a suffix to every short snippet of a sentence it can muster. Every prod thrust and involuntary contraction seems to energize her further, with her coyness faltering and her eyes filling up with so much joy and lust that they may as well be firing a beam right through my soul in an attempt to pin it to where it is. Moonlight then seems to blanket us as both our minds intertwine with a brief moment for a brief moment before being quickly pulled by their tails back to their now extremely messy reality. With the curtains called, both of our actors return to the anteroom. <laughs> Satisfied with their performance, and with us eagerly looking forward to the next show, wherever and whatever it may be. Very interesting. It was like highbrow porn, right? Yeah, it's like, you know when you go to those bookshops? Like those old yeah. musty bookshops, there's like books all over the walls, and you find that one with that really like... I don't know, sci-fi looking, like, burlesque cover or something. Yeah. On the cusp of being paper, born. Paperback, <laughs> like mothballs, yeah. Pretty much just porn for like, I don't know, rich white old women. I liked all the references to, uh, to Melty, like the beam yeah. and the uh, actors yeah, in the right. anteroom. Very, very cute, very cute. Princess of the Coom. I was expecting it to be more vulgar, just what? going by the title, right? All right, who should we read next? Audience, please suggest. Honestly, bathroom translator. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I, th I think English is his second language, so he had to translate okay. his story. You want to read that one? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. All right, let's do this one. I'll try my best. So, well, he translated it in English with the help yeah, of I'll, like- I'll, I'll try it and see if I can fill the gap. Let me uh, send it to you. Oh, hey, George is in here. Let's try it. Let's try it, George. Jorge. Jorge. Fucking call him George. Jesus Christ. Alright, you got it? Yeah. Alright. called Bathroom by uh, Jorge BH. So uh, it's time for you to get into your room. It's going to be a long night. You know that once the door is open, the, real, the roulette wheel will start to turn. That wheel which never means luck and despair will never shrink. Those moments of rest will turn to a mere illusion that you always miss a chance and chase. 
Memories of a false protection behind the bars of a cradle and it locked up. Once the door is open, there's nothing but a regular room. The bed is in the corner, where there is a window, and the bathroom behind a closed door is just at the other corner. It's small, but comfortable. The bed's mattress and its pillows are soft enough to give you that important healing sleep every person needs. Lights is turned off, it's time to sleep. Despite knowing is meaningless, you lay on your side to make sure you turn your back on that bathroom, hoping to not have to confront that menacing room the entire night. There aren't any clocks in the room. There's no need for such object when time starts to get distorted and the hours are deceptive. Your only option is to close your eyes and pray for the sun's rays to make you open them again when those rays pass through the window's curtains, calling it for a new morning. Where did I go wrong? Or perhaps it was never my fault. The Bible tells us that we're all born from original sin, but that's just not fair. Tomorrow must buy lettuce. The bus leaves at 7 a.m. God, I can't wait for this new song to be released. I curse you who are I curse whoever you are for torturing me with this. The water drops start to rumble. At first they're barely audible, but as the time goes they continue to get to more and more noisy, echoing throughout the entire room. It's useless trying to cover your ears, you know it because you'd already done it before. That sound won't stop morphing, and that's something you will never be able to ignore. Actually, it's easy to make it stop. You only need to go and close the main water tap. Or just call somebody to come and repair it for you, but that's what you may think. The moment to confront it is near. You go take the first step and turn to the other side of the bed, ready to get up, but this pressure makes it really hard. The next step should be opening your eyes and be welcomed with a dense fog. Fog that you will eventually turn into steam, making the temperature increase, trying to suffocate you and making you drop tears from every pore of your skin. After that comes the easy part, taking a few steps until reaching the bathroom's door, unless you get seduced by the other door which leads out of the room and surely ready to trap you inside an endless dream. Nightmares that always try to escape from the deepest parts of your mind. There is only one way, and that is confrontation. It's impossible to avoid fear. Inside the bathroom, that headless guy is probably waiting to greet you, reflected on the mirror. Or maybe this time it will be the serpent, who is anxious to curl around your neck and give you that last kiss you always wished for. Without noticing it, the noise had already changed long ago. Sycophantly, they started to call your name gradually becoming more and more like human voices, humans who are starting to howl, impatiently searching for that attention they always deserved. With that maddening buzzing, you find yourself in front of the bathroom door already. Today is your day, you really feel confident about making them stop once and for all, but suddenly it makes its return as the fruit of fear, or maybe it's not fear. Perhaps you really enjoy hearing them because it makes you feel special. It's a connection belonged only by you and that even death wouldn't assure it will be cut. The cold sensation of the handle makes you feel like an intense electrical current activates every nerve of your body to the limit, and the adrenaline takes over the fear. There will be nothing inside the bathroom. Your mind is probably just a big clown. So without hesitation, you open the door and... The sun's rays going through your curtain is announcing a new morning. The routine should start. People only appreciate productivity. No one will ever wait for you. You must start working as soon as possible. Time means money. Don't worry, because at the end of the day, you'll always have the rest you deserve. You'll need to continue working. Damn. Yeah, Damn. being a wagey sucks, dude. What? Being a wagey sucks. Dude, that first paragraph was like, <laughs> this one right here, that kind of hit. I really it's like time the, for you uh, to get in your room. Huh? About, like, um, the rolling over in the bed thing, because I definitely did that a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. Where I, like, I'd face away from a wall for some reason because I thought if I'd like sleep one way, I'd get nightmares, and if I like slept facing the wall, I wouldn't. I don't know why it was really fucking stupid, but yeah, I thought yeah. that's why that, I really like that paragraph a lot. I like a lot of the wording here, like uh, crying tears from every pore of your something, every pore of your body. I think it was I'm trying to find the sense. But this first one, this was a good opening. I thought. I think that translated really well. Right. Fuck you, man. It's good. It's like it's very poetic. Like, it's very uh, yeah i like it i like it it's like this it's like the stress of uh what do you call it of trying to get rest and there's like anxiety looming over in the room next to you right but i interpret it as like somebody has depression and like uh you know they're just like fuck like they like i got it like new day starting like oh shit here we go again like the fucking yeah. noise buzzing, all that stuff he says a lot of yeah, it sense I... translated was lost. I thought it'd be like, I don't know what I was expecting. Honestly, it still came across pretty well. Like maybe the original idea might have gotten lost along the way, but like I still enjoyed it a lot, and like I thought it was pretty like it was incredibly legible. I don't know. Yeah, 
It's about hallucination, for sure. I could feel like tense reading this, like the nightmares and shit. Fear. Like an, uh, what is that? Um... And I like how it's uh, non distinct. Who like, is maybe the it's guy? the headless guy or the serpent. Batman. Huh? Who's the guy that played Batman? Christian Bale, Christian Bale. Uh, what was that oh. movie where he. Super skinny, right? Yeah, 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 he like yeah. lost so so much weight, and he was like hallucinating yeah. and shit. Yeah, because he sleep deprived. The ma like that, machinist, like, machinist, yeah. yeah, machinist, yeah. machinist. That was a good movie. I kind of got those that's vibes kind of, here. That's kind know. of what I was getting from this, where he's like, yeah. damn, that was good. That was very interesting. Interesting, interesting. Alrighty, next up. Huh. All right. What's next? Who votes? Who votes? Top three. First three people to put in a vote will something something. All right, Bingus. <clears throat> Bingus. Who else? Bingus. All right. Is it Bingus? Also, thanks for reading with me, Damar. Appreciate it. It'd be tiring on my throat to like yeah, get all yeah. these words up. All right, Bingus, it is. All righty. I think I skimmed uh, an earlier copy of this, an earlier draft of this, and it looked really analytic, which I like. All right, ready? Why I really like Tsukihime from Bing. There are a few works I've enjoyed more than Tsukihime. The art, music, characters, and story all resonate with me deeply, and I don't think I could, and I don't think I could ever forget it. Tsukihime exists as one of the few visual novels that I can replay over and over, and oftentimes when I do enjoy the experience, as if it was my first time. I'm jealous. I can't get that feeling. There are notable flaws such as weird sprites, the writing during erotic scenes, the dated engine, among other things. But overall, these things are overshadowing how brilliant Tsukihime is. The music for Tsukihime. Hope there's no spoils. <laughs> the music for Tsukihime is brilliant. There's almost a constant undertone of familiarity and melancholy to many of the pieces in the soundtrack. Wasn't it like free music that they used mostly? I think it was royalty free music that they found. Yeah, royalty free, yeah. Rather, it's impressive that such a small soundtrack could even work with a visual novel like Tsukihime. The best part, or but part of that is in its utter simplicity and ability to convey the correct emotional tone despite its limitations. There's almost a certain chemistry when combined with the scenery and backgrounds of the visual novel uses, which produces a dreamy mirror sensation. Something that even inspired other visual novel creators like Ryukishi 07. Overall, the soundtrack was probably one of the best accompanying ones to a visual novel I've seen. Despite its short track list and length, it never feels out of place or forced in any scene. Part of why I think it's so successful was how much it complemented other elements of the story. Tsukihime is really a story that encompasses themes of death, mystery, nostalgia, melancholy, and regret, all of which are succulently packed into 10 midi tracks. I agree, I like the fucking... I like the OST. <clears throat> the cast of Tsukihime was one of, is one of its strongest points. Almost anyone who touches the visual novel will come away with some infatuation with one of the main heroines. The company world building plays a huge role in framing many of their eccentricities and qualities. Each heroine has enough depth to carry their own route and demonstrate a degree of chemistry with Shiki and other characters of the story. Part of the appeal in a lot of these characters, I feel, is the contrast between their outwardly facing appearances and the characters beneath them. Letting you peel away at the surface to get to find different traits underneath. Almost all the main heroines utilize facades to great effect and during points in the narrative, they have them utterly destroyed and torn apart. Akiya isn't the cold, authoritative sister she's made out to be. Hisui isn't the expressionless maid she's depicted as. Her creed is simultaneously more ruthless and naive than her goofball persona projects. CL's role as an upperclassman is a disguise used to great effect, and Kohaku behind her smile is a miserable and tragic girl. This complexity to the heroine's character makes them believable and extremely likable as a, consequences, as a consequence. Ultimately, many of the heroines in Tsukihime are incredibly lonely, just like me lol, yeah I'm reading that. And part of their main conflict stems from this. 
A creed has never had the opportunity to go out and heartily enjoy the company of another person before. The new opportunity presented by Shiki to mingle and hang out, enjoying the frivolous distractions of the modern world, is a reflection of how utterly devoid her existence was of any genuine friendship or romances. I remember the choice too. It's either like there's three. Take her through the movie. Uh I forgot the second one, but then the third one was take her take her to the alley. Like <laughs> uh I forget what the third option was. I think there was a third. But the movie one is the is the right option. It's like something simple and dumb, but it's like something that Ark never really experienced in her naivety. These feelings also produce genuine anxiety and distress when Shiki doesn't follow through on the promises he makes to her. Ciel never got to live out her childhood as a girl growing up from humble origins. Her sole purpose for being is ending Roa so she might finally die. Her existence is similar to that of the Kruids, being singular in her purpose and never getting the experience of true companionship that can be found in others. Unlike the naivety of Ark, she is wholly cynical, hoping to finally be able to die at the end of her conflict with Roa. Her involvement with Shiki changes this. For Akiha, her loneliness stems from losing her entire family, being forced to inherit the role of the Tono household. Her unrequited feelings for Shiki are impaired both by the damage done to his memory by Maki Hasa and the urges and consequences of her blood, which almost turn her reclusive. Akiha's feelings for Shiki almost become psychotic when they aren't reciprocated in Kohaku's route. Exploding into emotionally charged anger, and in other routes, Akio will throw herself at certain death to protect Shiki at any cost. Isui, through her knowledge of the sexual abuse enacted upon her sister, develops androphobia. It was only through Shiki's force of personality that she was even able to come out of her shell, but in his absence, she regresses into a solitary and quiet girl, unable to achieve the same joy and smile she could before. Romantic affection is acquired and persists through, uh, through her trauma and androphobia. Hisui best made. Uh, Kohaku's outward personality was a facade conducted to emulate Hisui, who she was deeply and immensely jealous of, although she does not openly understand this. Rather, her emula emulation of Hisui reflects her desire to have a real childhood and real childhood love with Chiki, instead of the abuse she suffered under Makihasa. Her loneliness shines through when the cracks in her personality become defined, confiding in Chiki that she doesn't know how anything, how to be anything more than a fake. These complexities are part of the reason why so many walk away from the visual novel with intense and complex admiration, admiration for the characters, since they are written in a very real, 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 realistic and conceiving ways. The narrative itself is filled with great, many great themes and lessons that still resonate with me now. The tragedy of, of first loves, the acceptance of death, the value in living a meaningful life. Vampires in Tsukihime aren't necessarily evil because they take human life, but more so evil because they betray the sanctity of it. Many of the vampires are abominations of nature, doomed to destruction, and becoming outhorned entities that perpetuate their own being. In escaping death, vampires in, Tsukihime, in the Tsukihime universe are subject to horrible states of existence living in constant pain, losing their self-identity, and unable to truly value life. This extends to even other ent entries like Melty Blood, where Warachia War is a tragic hero reduced to consumption and insanity due to his immortality. Ultimately, vampires are miserable creatures and even pitiful, something the narrative very much acknowledges, to the point even completely villainous characters can be sympathetic. Nero, through his own efforts, is more beast than man, through the con through more beast than man, the composition of his 666 bodies have resulted in him surrendering his remaining humanity and cognition, and effectively sharing what it means to be the risker with the beasts that make up his body. However, effectively his ego and self-identity is being consumed from within, he himself acknowledging that at some point he may up surrendering himself to the chaos of the beast inside him. This is similar to the main antagonist of the story, Roa, who in his efforts to search for true immortality devises a stratagem wherein he inherits the body of powerful and influential people to advance his own girls and persist. This is all for naught, forever. When his 17th reincarnation, the pollution of different personalities and upbringings from his former hosts have rendered him so confused and muddled he barely resembles the person he was. The reason this is so important is that nearly every vampire starts from the same place of good, but extremists intentions to better themselves, mankind, or magecraft. Let me read that sentence again. 
The reason this is so important is that every, nearly every vampire starts from the same place of good but extremist intentions to better themselves, mankind, or magecraft. Each wish to use their own immortality to further their agendas, however this eventually flips and perpetuates their own demise, supersedes any attachment they had to their own form or humanity, drastically deforming them to the monsters that Chiki eventually ends. My personal favorite route and character has always been Kaku's, mostly because of its complexity of its heroine and her chemistry with the protagonist, Shiki Toro. The foundation of the route revolves on Kohaku's revenge for the sexual abuse she suffered under Makihisa Toro. Before Shiki ends up leaving the mansion, Kohaku decides to give her him her white ribbon, making him promise her that he'll return it when he gets back to the mansion. This is both a cry for help and an insight into Kaku's own character. To her, the ribbon represents a small promise, one that if not kept will prevent her from following through with her intentions to enact revenge on the Tonos. But for the main protagonist, it means something much more deep and meaningful. It was an acknowledgement that someone, anyone, actually cared for him or even wanted him back at that household. And he also notes later that in the route that it had a significant effect on him and helped him through troubled times, encouraging him back to the mansion. When he relays to Kohaku his reasons for not returning to it to Hisui, who he thinks was the twin, to give him the ribbon, Kohaku falters and expresses stress and distress on hearing how much it actually saved him. This is actually a big aspect of the route where Kohaku comes to terms with a troubled childhood and understands that what she truly wants and loves. Kohaku throughout her route is forced over and over again to confront hard decisions about her plan and her goal in utilizing Shiki to achieve them. When Shiki acknowledges his contempt, when Shiki acknowledges his contempt for doctors, but his unconditional trust in Kohaku's expertise, he understands that she is fundamentally training his distrust for a goal that is becoming increasingly less and less palatable to her, showing more and more concern in the welfare of her benefactor Akia Tono. Part of what I truly adore about Kohaku's route is the careful breakdown of her outer shell and her redemption through her love for not just Shiki but Akia also. At the end of the route, she is able to break through her perception of herself of an unfeeling doll, acknowledging that what she is now is as true as any other Kohaku she's been. Finally, at the end of all things, she's able to welcome Shiki home with a smile. My thoughts on the remake are that it was well deserved and well worth the wait. The improved production values have produced a stellar PV for the new Tsukihime, and while I can disagree with some of the decisions of altered design on some characters, I've truly never been this excited for something in a long time. What looks like new characters and potentially new route for series Punching Bad Satsuki. <laughs> punching Bag? Punching Bag Satsuki has invigorated a lot of interest and speculation. While I didn't write a thesis on Tsukihime, I came as close as I was comfortable with. I think it's a great visual novel that re deserves a remake. The characters, music, art, and story still resonate with me, and I still sometimes find myself thinking about it and the strange world it depicted, which I feel is a testament to its quality and would recommend it wholeheartedly to anyone I'd meet. Pretty thorough analysis. I like it. I covered, like, pretty much. I like that he covered more of the characters than the, uh, like, overall setting or, like, specific. Yeah. You know, lore details. Like, oh, lines of death, and I cut yeah. him, and, you know. It was very heartfelt, yeah. It felt very heartfelt of, uh, of a, of a, of a writing. Yeah. Like, I only finished three out of the five routes. So seeing a whole comprehensive view on it is very interesting. Yeah, I never played through Rikiya's stuff. I did ARC and CL's 100% and then Hisui's. And then I just stopped because I was like, yeah, Hisui, best made. Oh, interesting. Very good. Very good, Bingus. <laughs> Alright, next. Any other thoughts on that one? No. Still is that pretty good. All right. I, th I like that one because a lot of the things were about like, a lot of the things we've read so far, let's see. This one, funny. Cahoots, funny. This one was very like, invoked a lot of emotions. 
this one was 10. So we've had like a very wide variety of different oh, yeah. um, types. Very interesting. But Bingus definitely has a lot of motion, emotion behind his. Even though it's like an analytical essay, it's more like there's a lot of passion behind it. Right, he likes the it. characters. Yeah. And enjoys them, yeah. This game is fucking like 20 years old now. Like, <laughs> I think it's 20 or something years old. Yeah. Dude. It's about 20. It's crazy. It's somewhere around there. Yeah. All right, who's next? You have any preferences, Damar? Uh, I want to read Elto's. <laughs> All right. Elto wants bloody to stop spending money like this. Txt. All right, I'll send it to you. Able <laughs> to read. Alrighty. So it's called the Elto Guide to Trying Cigars and Whiskey slash A, depending how you want to spell it. Uh, look, I'm not your mom, just a text document. Find out your favorite cigar and whiskey and see if it works. I don't know. Why 90% of Melty Blood actress again, current code players suck ass. I mean, you've seen the people who play in the Melty Cord Laval. Why FF14 is fundamentally worse than FF11. It's basically WoW, but in Final Fantasy with better graphics and music and hot cat boys and hot cat daddies. Actually, never mind, it's pretty good, I guess. Is it me or are fighting games really lately really shitty? The answer is yes. They are they really aren't as good. Imagine wanting to actively play Street Fighter V or thinking Arxis is finally gonna listen to y'all with your We're done with the shitty netcode and is that Anji? Oh my god, I'm buying it again. I can't wait for the next sixty dollar DLC. I got Steam VR and my thoughts on VR. I would give a pretty good actual well thought out section here, but my Valve index doesn't work well out. Thanks one case <laughs> Steam system and I can't use it on day two. Okay, serious Elto guide to trying cigars and drink combinations. Oh, before so you get into that, tips. I was like, Elto, you should write something. And then I gave him those lists as possible topics. So he, uh, he's just like addressing those real Listing quick. Listing them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I would give a pretty good actual well thought out section here. Oh, wait, shit, my bad. Uh, so let's get started with the basics. With cigars, you have four basic types in regards to flavor. You have Connecticut's, so these types of cigars will always be mild and more on the lighter, creamy side. They're distinguishable since they'll always be a very pale side when you go to the cigar shop. These are very, very good to get someone into cigars for the first time since they will make you puke like beans. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I'm going to fuck up this pronunciation. Corojos? Corojo, um, I think. These types are slightly more darker than Connecticut's and have a more pepper and spice aroma and flavor. Uh, they're also a pretty decent start for a new cigar and people since some people who are used to barbecue pit life can handle more smoke than a new person. Uh, Habanos, so I hope you're noticing a trend. Uh, these types are even more darker than Corojos. Uh, they're something I'd recommend to someone who has had a few good cigars and experience before trying. That these, these types of cigars will most certainly remind you of coffee beans, wood, leather, and spices. That sounds good. Uh, and Maduros, so the last most common types, yes, those these will be the dark brown to almost black cigars you'll see. Uh, they're aged and have way more complex flavors compared to a Habano. Uh, you can certainly experience a wide range of flavors depending on the brand fermentation. Uh, this is the type you would want to hold off on ever trying until you've had some experience. Again, remember when Beansy threw up after he thought he was cool enough after his first cigar? <laughs> Never forget Beansy. Damn, we gotta XD. rub it in, bro. Damn. <laughs> All yeah, right. so for context, uh, we had a trip in Seattle. It was just like four, three years ago now? Two years? Three. Three, three yeah. years ago. And uh, we had an Airbnb and we just like rented out the place for a week and we we're just hanging out, being dudes. And uh, Elto brought some cigars and Beansy hadn't had a cigar before. <laughs> I don't think you hadn't had one either before, had you? Or no. had you? No. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so anyways, he gave... <laughs> Means he's like, I can handle it. And then they went outside. And then, like five minutes later, Beans is like, he's like, I feel kind of lightheaded or like, kind of woozy. And then he's in the bathroom. And then you can just hear him heaving in the bathroom. And Beans, he walks out looking pale as fuck. And he's like, 
And Elto's just laughing his ass off, and yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Dude, Zagaris could fuck you up, dude. Um, but yeah, anyways, let me continue with the uh, guide. So with all that out of the way, how do you pair your choice of alcohol or drink with cigars? Well, you have two schools of thought. Do you compliment your cigar if you say choose a Connecticut wrapper with a light type of whiskey with no peat? Uh, or do you compliment by offsetting what you drink with something stronger and with peat? There isn't an actual yes or no answer since, like cooking, some people prefer to double down on a particular flavor palette, think chocolate ice cream with chocolate syrup, uh, or have complementary but separate flavor profiles, so salty and sweet. Uh, my preferred method is to always offset my whiskey and cigar so that while separate, one does not overpower the other. Um, you end up getting a brand new taste from both adding something new to the cigar and whiskey. One of my favorite combinations is having an Abelor 16 with an Olivia Siri V, or 5, sorry, Jesus Christ. Uh, Abelor 16 uh, is a scotch from uh, Speyside, which usually ends up being on the more sweeter side, and Asian sherry casks to give it an even more sweet, uh, fuck, I lost myself. Sweetness, uh, sweetness yeah, uh, while the Olivia Siri 5 is a full-bodied, spicier cigar. Uh, when I drink Abelor by itself, it has a natural sweetness that I love. Uh, and the Olivia by itself has a very robust flavor of spice when smoking. Uh, individually, these are both amazing and some of my personal favorites, but when you have them together, they pair well since they both have something unique to add to the overall experience. Uh, you end up with a very strong smoke that when you take a sip of Abelure, uh, gets mellowed out with the natural sweetness of the scotch. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you take another sip of scotch, you get more sweetness, and having a puff of cigar adds a new range of flavors that makes the sip more strong and reduce the sweetness, but adds a natural smokiness to it. This is, in my opinion, how you should pair the two together. I do personally not see the benefits of having, adding more smoke to smoke or more sweet to sweet, but in the end, it's all personal choice. I see lots of people smoke Maduros and have scotches like Ardberg 10, one of the peatiest scotches out there. Uh, the best way to experience is to just try it yourself. Uh, why bloody should keep the 1k to himself stop <laughs> wasting money like this before holy shit You made me write this to make sure you don't throw it away. Come on, man angry face Plus dude remember at magfest who got so mad at me and Garo He wouldn't shake my hand and the next day he wanted to run back But I never played my main the entire set and just left just up and left to go to the tournament. I cackled so hard. That was amazing <laughs> Okay, I love you. Bye. Bye and a little rabbit <laughs> That's I think that was interesting. It's very uh, technical, right? Yeah, very I wish technical. he wrote more on the uh, like uh, flavor about profile stuff. I thought that was yeah. interesting. Yeah, about the mixing. Hmm. Okay. Hey, Alto. I see you. Pachi, pachi, pachi. I don't know a lot about smoking or drinking, so that's very interesting to me. Oh, nice. You've been meaning to learn more about whiskey. Perfect. Yeah, Elto. <laughs> I think he's lost interest. He's probably already like wandered off somewhere. I don't know if he's still here. Because he'd be shit posting if he was. Oh, he is? He said I had 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. That was good. All right. And shoddy, okay. Next read. Huh. All right, votes, votes. First three votes, and then if there's a tiebreaker, we'll do that. What should we read next? Bacon's is long, and Keto's is, I don't know. Magical Egg is like a fantasy f story? I don't know anything about monster or stars. Ishii. That one vote for 7A, 7E, 4C, 7E, C, 2C, 9 <laughs> I, I don't know what that uh, what that uh, is supposed Wait, to be. Correction. But I know it's like, Alpha, it's something. 7 Echo, oh. 4 Charlie, 7 Echo Charlie, 2 Charlie Delta, 9 Delta Alpha. I think it's the eight. kanji. It's the kanji here. Oh. <laughs> it's like trying to... <laughs> All right. Uh, let's read Ishi. Ishi's document bars. Ishi the killer. Ishi the killer. All right. <clears throat> Orion sisters, in the night sky where our eternities are mere moments, there were. Hold on, let me queue up more of X Challenger. Actually, let's play Echoes of Sun. 
Okay. In the night sky where our eternities are mere moments, there were the twin queens of Orion. The powerful demon queen Betel Geese bore the red color of bloodshed. The mighty angel queen Rigel, the white color of silver swords. The twin queens were treacherous and cruel, and their power was final. With the three emissaries, the sisters Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka executing their will. No other was to be as beautiful and brilliant as the queens, and those who defined their supremacy were forced to give up their brightness for them. Huh. One time, the queen sent the sisters to Canis, a faraway place where there was only one who was brighter than them. They traveled far south, and in the emptiness, they met only a lonely prince. Sirius, he was called, and his radiance was blinding, shining with the colors of the rainbow. He was powerful, but there was nothing for him to exert his power on, as power did not interest him anymore. His only companion was, a, was an enormous sickly wolf, who, barely visible in the darkness, served as his loyal steed and throne. Mintaka looked closely at the prince. He would not look at her. His eyes were blank. The intense radiance of his own being rendered him permanently blind. Holy shit, that's awesome. Instead, he looked away, far to the south of the void. Into the void. You are shining so brightly, but that means that soon you will go dim and die. Give your brightness a purpose and help our queen shine more than any other in the night sky, said al -Natak. I have a greater purpose than your twin queen's greed. They hold no power over me. Leave this place at once and do not return, for I want to be at peace, he replied. And so they left, for the prince was bold, and he was not going to be swayed so easily. The queens were enraged at the defiance of the foreign prince. Their reign over the other kingdoms was absolute, and this unknown prince could not defy the absolute. And they sent the three sisters again to promise Sirius desolation if he did not submit. But Sirius was not troubled, for he knew that he would never be truly alone, his only companion in life being the wolf. Oh, the wolf is so dead. As punishment for the insolence of the queens, he ordered Mintaka to stay with him and the remaining sisters to return, warning them that he would take more if the queens continued exerting their greed. Warning them that he would take more. <laughs> Alnatak and Alnilam returned to their queens, promising to meet Mintaka again. The sisters were not bellicose like their masters, and said they only did their bidding because this, it was all they ever knew. Why are you alone? said Mintaka. I am not alone. I have my friend the pup. He used to be mighty and bright, but now he is old and dim, and I must take care of him before he dies. He has never known dark, and I will ensure that he knows light for the rest of his time with me. Is that why you shine so brightly? He said nothing, not even not ever turning away his head from away from the void. Mintaka smiled and stroked the wolf's back. She could feel his bones under his thin, sickly skin. Rigal and Bellatil Goose were incensed. All the other kingdoms kneeled without question, and those that did not were swiftly crushed with their entire might. Promising war, they sent to Alnatag and Alnilam to the prince. But the prince once again ignored them and asked both to remain with him, and with the prince they learned about compassion. Why is he dying? said Alnilam. We will all die. It is our duty to make our lives something of worth. The pup has served me eons ago as my loyal companion. As his life reaches its end, I will accompany him too and ensure him a warm, gentle goodbye. I have seen many give up their brightness for my queens. I do not think they would give back even a minuscule part of theirs, even if I was dying like your friend. That is because you are a tool, a tool to them, not a friend. The queens left their places in the sky, determined to meet this insolent prince and take what was owed to them by divine right. They traveled far south, where they were met the shining prince and the maidens who kept them company. The sisters pleaded with them to not diminish him, as his sacrifice mo moved them. But the queens only saw his radiance and was admiring it, but determined to steal it, demanded he give it over. However, the prince was ancient, and he knew greed, and he knew it was insatiable, so he to the queens he said magnificent that you are that you both are i would only give up my brightness to the most luminous of you for she deserves to rule as the brightest in the sky oh my god they're gonna kill each other but the prince was blind out of his compassion and he could see nothing and the queens blinded with rage did not see through his ruse turning instead against each other for the right to the prince's shine they departed taking the sisters back with them 
And as they left, the prince finally turned away from the void and bid them farewell, promising he would wait for their return. And that is why, if you look up at the sky and find Orion, the Orion constellation, you will see Bel Betelgeese, red and seething with anger, and Riggle, burning with white-hot fury, staring each other down, one attempting to outshine the other, while the three sisters, humble and dim, stand between them and look down to the south, watching Sirius from far away, who shines as brightly as ever, determined to one day meet again his friends. Yeah. Wow. Sounded like a... Like, like a folktale kind of-ish. Yeah, like a myth. Like a family story uh, kind of thing. Cool. Did they copy this from somewhere? Because that was like really well written. Like, I'm sure this uh, story has existed, right? Like the lore. But for it to be written this concisely... Is like, no, this is fake. Fake. He copied this from somewhere. Holy shit. No results on Google. Damn. This was really well written. Holy shit. Is Ishii here? Where's Ishii? Ishii, Ishii, Ishii. That was really good. That was like... Yeah, I really enjoyed it a lot. Like, if you got a fucking book on, like, lore on the stars, this would, like, legit fit in right next to it. Like, this is how the story went, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was really good. Are they awake? Yeah, they're up. I wonder if they're watching right now. Holy shit. I was like, okay, if you asked me to write about the story of Hercules, I'd be like, okay, he he was strong and he like killed some giants or something, right? But holy shit, this was like very well written. I don't believe this is real. That's fake. They sent Episode. someone else's work. All right, <laughs> that was really fucking good. Seriously, that was really well written. Even though it's not like, like their own story or anything. Damn, great presentation. All right, who's next? Damar, you want to choose? You pick. Me? Yep. Actually, Bacon's. I want to read the power. I want to read the power of music. Okay. I think this is more of a technical piece, too. Alright, I'll send that to you. That was really... That was really well written. Like, that's definitely... I'm pretty sure that's like the real mythos, but the way they okay. wrote it, very interesting, very Stinky clean. English majors. <laughs> just kidding. It was really good, oh. I just enjoyed it a lot. Nilla just entered something. I'll add it to the list. Okay, so I'm gonna start reading this one. Alright, go ahead. Oh. Okay, so this one's called The uh, Power of Music uh, by Death Alica, yep. I believe. Apologies if I mispronounced. Um, so the topic of the short writing interests me for quite some time, since music is the universal language all of us can enjoy. Uh, music was a part of humanity since the times of the caveman and stayed with us even today, even though it has no practical function in this highly practical and efficient obsessed world. Does it really not, though? To drive my point home, I will compare two musical subcultures that on the surface seem the total opposite of each other, idol culture and the world of heavy metal. But first, let us try to generally describe music. I'm sure there are academics who can give an accurate and succinct explanation, but I'm just a layman and thus going to use layman vocabulary for similar layman. Music is escapism. Music is the muse, and music is a distraction. Music helps us temporarily forget our woes or elevate the hardships of a certain task. It inspires us, it helps us to concentrate, and it helps us wind down. Just by this, we can already see that music is so much more than just a silly pastime activity. 
Music is also a business, with millions and millions of dollars spent on it, and this is a known fact by both musicians and publishers alike. Music is also a form of power, a form of control. Through music, artists can manipulate and affect our emotions and dictate what and how we should feel. This simple reason can make film soundtracks powerful weapons. An otherwise mediocre scene with an average directorial input can still be memorable and effective due to accompanying tune. The same scene can be hilarious, depressing, con contemplatory, or frightening. Uh, this same psychological trick is used in all forms of music and we willingly allow ourselves to be flooded by emotions that otherwise would not surface due to social constraints or innate shyness. We will willingly accept this because, as we stated, music is a way of escaping reality. Thus we arrive to the second part of this short little text. If we accept this statement, then we also must accept that both music loved by idol fans and metalheads use the same methodology. I believe this is fundamentally truth, but there are differences as well. To better illustrate this, let me briefly touch upon the reason for why fans of these musical phenomena seek out these materials. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me again. Jesus. Uh, first, we'll discuss idols and their music. Uh, at first glance, it might seem like nothing more than traditional pop music. The only marked difference being the emphasis is often given on the teams instead of individuals. Though even in pop culture, there are groups of singers and vice versa. There were also and uh, there were and are solo idol projects too, but generally the accepted norm is that idols perform in groups. Um, idols represent a purity and innocence that is not necessary for pop artists. The music is catchy and upbeat, concentrates on vocal performance instead of instrumentation, and the subject matters vary, but generally gives it a positive and encouraging atmosphere. Of course, this is all a very well-crafted ruse intended to give us a non-existent strength and do-founded determination to the listener. It gives us feelings of hope that no matter how hard life is, it will be better. Which is a blatant lie, since the laundry still awaits us after AKB48, we still need to pay the bills, with love live, and we are getting older and less healthy, no matter how often we listen to K-pop boy idols. The music only draws out positive vibes due to its vivid, energetic nature, generally good-looking performers, and easy-to-follow rhythm-based structure. Comparing this to the harsh world of heavy metal music, one might think that the two groups are irreconcilable. Um, followers of the latter subculture, besides tending that to their form of art is absolutely superior to everything else, prefer instruments over singing, scary-looking drunkards to models, and beating each other up, and generally being a nuisance to the rest of the society. This is all true, but the main reason turns to this kind of aggressive sound is because of the immense stress of everyday life. They bottle up rage and anxiety, and this sort of entertainment allows them to just let loose in a more controlled environment. Though concert injuries are common, the sudden urge surge of these feelings can also have somewhat calming effect since we feel that we can finally express our anger and hatred towards anything without society scrutinizing us. Heavy metal, and to a lesser extent rock music in general, heightens our sense of aggression through adrenaline by giving us loud, dissonant melodies, shouting vocals, and a direct invitation to concentration called mosh pits. This is an effective way of temporarily relieving frustration, which of course will come back the next time we face something annoying or taxing in life. Then we just turn on another record and excuse the profanity, fuck shit up. <laughs> Metal also concentrates on more sad and unjust part of life, greatly enhancing our own sense of negativity around us. We may not be able to name it, but the music still allows us to realize that not everything is sunshine and rainbows and we may feel we want to do something about. Of course we can't most of the time, but the music awakens our sense of justice. To sum it up, music is not only a mere pastime activity, but a tool that can be used to emotionally affect the listener, and the listener probably knows this too. Different kinds of music uh, resonates with emotional states, and if used in a meticulous, effective way, it can cause an extreme behavior such as crying loudly, breaking objects, clapping, and shouting uncontrollably, smiling, and laughing. Yeah, Americans fucking love clapping. <laughs> uh, music in the end is beautiful. No matter what is your preferred genre, you will listen to it because it affects you in some way. Interesting. Okay, pretty good. I liked it. Good job, Death. It's a very broad topic, but I think you approached it in like a very personal way, right? I assume you both listen to listen to both idol music and rock. Where's the lie? What lie? Yeah, like the way it was written, it seems like they're fairly familiar with both, like both genres right yeah yeah very interesting all right i added nilla's uh entry <laughs> uh joshi yamizuka um interesting all right 
Any votes on who we read next? Any votes? Any votes? Any votes? If not, I'll read uh, maybe Neko Ultimas. Ish monster. Okay. Any other votes? All right. Lucky's the only one who said anything. So let's read this. Oh god, it's long. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's go for it. Is this easy to see? Yeah, yeah. okay. All right. Monster by Fish. My imprisonment is difficult to explain. Every breath I take yields neither air nor smell. My voice makes not a single noise. I cry out for help, or as the time has passed, I cry out of loneliness. But no sound is uttered. Uh, hold on, let me change the spacing. Because that's weird. Okay, this looks better. Alrighty. <clears throat> Let's start over. Monster. My imprisonment is difficult to explain. Every breath I take yields neither air nor smell. My voice makes not a single noise. I cry out for help, or as the time has passed, I cry out of loneliness. But no sound is uttered. The pounding of my fists against the gray nothingness of my confines returns a similar sensation of nothingness. Even the comforting warmth of my own body is denied to me. It is a murky hell, devoid of all sensation. Running carries me nowhere from nowhere. Am I even moving? I honestly cannot say. My confines are an unrelenting gray murk. Uh, neither bright nor dark. Thick and impenetrable like a riverbank fog. No one blows through my hair or caresses my skin. Neither is there the whistling sound of the wind as it blows through branches and rooftops. Silence and stillness suffocate me. Was there... Were there anything or anyone beyond me I doubted? There isn't a place where bright and cheerful things frolic. Neither is it some den of evil where hate-filled, spiteful creatures plot advances against mortals lest they would have gobbled me up already. There's simply nothing here. Not even the gods. Not even light or shadow. Nothing here except me, a mortal. Or what is left of me. What is left of me? But damn, what an entry. Or er, an entrance. Uh... Uranos is the land I met my fate in. It is a cursed land of legend inhabited by all manner of unsavory beasts, foul monstrosities, dastardly outlaws, the mad, the desperate, and heaven knows what else. All of Uranos is dense marsh and swampland, and it is always raining. Penetrating the heart of this untamable swamp is the perfect opportunity for any man foolhardily enough to throw away his life, to throw his life away in the pursuit of dense pocketfuls of gold. Me. I was part of an expedition in search of lost treasure. Search for lost treasure. We numbered two scores and a dozen. Scholars, warriors, hunters, and a few laborers. A fool's endeavor, I thought. Regardless of finding any treasure or not, most likely not, I would be paid. And hands to leave that too. Five years worth of wages from being a mindless zealot in the Holy Army, which was my next competing offer. So I weighed my prospects between meeting a slow, horrible end in some godforsaken swamp versus meeting a painful yet immediate end in a godforsaken holy war versus dying of starvation like a dog. I saw the heart of Uranos after a glacially slow after a glacially slow pace through the hundreds of days of trek through the swamplands. We few left encountered a cobblestone road in the mountainous regions in the northeast. The road snaked widely downwards into the valley below, urging us to venture deeper into this northeasterly heading. In the swamps, we often encountered the ruins of villages and farms long gone. They were rotted to the ground. Uranos had reclaimed them. Save for a few particular jets of stone, we would have missed that they were structures entirely. This road, however, was something else entirely. Uh, it was made of stone. Weeds sprouted from the corners of its blocks. However, it wasn't entirely consumed by the nature around it, not like everything else was. Assam was the one who discovered the road. He was a sailor, soldier, a pirate, a monk, and now a scholar. He was a hell of a man, and many times over did he save my life despite me being employed for the opposite purpose. 
Uranos was once a kingdom, a holy city too, a real one. Many legends and tales originate from there. The scriptures depict it as a paradise, a beautiful city blessed by the gods, sculpted of white marble and possessed, possessing finely crafted stonework and masonry. Gardens of flowers of many vivid colorations hung from each of house, each house. Courageous men and beautiful women alike inhabited the city and called it home. No city was was or ever since has been its equal. Traversing the horrors of the swamp were the worst days of my life. I bore witness to numerous terrors. Man-eating creatures snatched us up and ripped limb from and ripped limbs from bodies in an instant. Some lay in wait, camouflaged and simply plucked whatever unfortunate soul deemed to venture too close to it that day. Walking across that centuries-old road felt glorious. The tattered remains of my wet boots squished and clopped gladly as I went along. The road curved around the sides of the hill. It embraced as if it were a serpent squeezing its prey. The further down we ventured, the more the swamp receded. The canopies of the immense trees casted a great shadow that blotted out the dark sky. I've spent months navigating this darkness. My gaze has long since adapted to this oppressively blue and black world. Quiet now. The birds, crickets, monkeys, and frogs, and all uh, other small creatures were not down here in this valley. No bugs, either. Downwards we went, pressing hard. From swampy hilltop, we were led to an even leveled field of dead dry grass. Intricately carved stone ruins were scattered here and there. We were in a darkened valley where no life resided. The road went on for a considerable distance to the entry of a cave lying at the foot of another hill on the opposite side of the valley. A good place to make camp. Each man unfastened the cape on his back and lays it on the ground. A fire started and I take first watch. Something woke me. It whispered. I heard it speak the language of man. Only the most foul creatures can speak mortal languages. I was on my feet an instant in an instant, sword unsheathed. Total darkness. I waited for my eyes to adjust. Our watchman was gone, and so was our fire. We numbered five now. Everyone else was still asleep. I roused them quickly. Frogs, bats, and crickets croaked, squeaked, and chirped, out, but not from this valley. The only sounds that could be heard were from the swamps above us. Waiting until dawn to search for our missing companion seemed like up the plan. However, in the distance, toward the cave, I saw a dim light. Our missing man, maybe? It was a 20 minute walk at best. Two of our party volunteers scouted ahead. One of them was me. Our feet crunched across the dry grass, dirt, and ancient stone road. We advanced through blackest darkness, no light to guide us save for the one ahead at our destination. An odd sensation developed in my stomach and crawled its way into my throat. My muscles were tensing in fear. I could not shake the feeling, but I still had work to do. Onwards, with my partner, him taking the lead. A flash! What was that? I tried to spy the source out of the corner of my eyes. Before we departed, Assam warned us to keep looking forward and not to stray from the road. Off the road, the dry grass rose taller to about the head of a child. Desiccated trees and wooden and stone houses started to appear. Another flash, a dim blue light. It appeared and faded in a wink. The creeping feeling in my throat tightened, yet we kept going. Another flash, and another. The further we pressed, the more and more common the lights until they were at the foot of the cave. The lights were not shy anymore. They stopped vanishing. They were tiny balls of dim blue fire dancing on the cold night air. The mouth of the cave was massive, enough for an entire dragon to fit through it, and it was pitch black. There was no way we could explore it tonight. We stood at the foot of the cave and called the name of our lost companion. It echoed off the walls of the cave. When no response was had, we decided to cut loose and return to camp. There was still an echo. The glowing lights bounced jubilantly. They vibrated uh, and buzzed. And the name of our lost companion was echoed back to us in the whispers of a hundred voices. Men, women, and children, and the elderly. A hundred voices whispered our lost man's name into my ear. The light buzzed and glowed, glowed brighter. Where they once danced gracefully, they now shook violently. They surrounded us in great number and illuminated the way back. The brightness was disorienting. The flashing lights, the whispering. I grew vexed. I drew my sword. Is this the best the spirit can do? Call out names and shine bright lights? I could do this. If you want me to come, I'll take... Er, if you want me, come take... If you want me, come and take me, and I'm right here. 
Sunlight, faint, and echoes of birdsong. A single beam of the sun's ray is weaved through multiple canopies to find its way down to this forsaken valley. It was midday. No more lights and no more whispers. Blisters formed on my hand from gripping my sword throughout the night. My companions were staring at me. I was back at camp. We were all back at camp. Six again. The light held power to lead men astray, tempting them to parts unknown. Our lost watchmen met a similar encounter. At Assam's instructions, both me and our lost watchmen were to remain in camp while the remaining four plunged into the cave. About a stone's throw away from the mouth of the cave lay the entrance to city. THE city. Uranos, the holy city of legend. In a cave? <coughs> Who would have thought? Are you sure, Assam, that I am afraid of neither spirit, the whispers of the dead, nor flashing lights, and I vow not to be ast led astray again? So does our found watchman. In the end, it was agreed that we would both come on the condition that every man would be bound by the waist by a length of rope. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. We eat some dried meat and great sour fruits, courtesy of Uranus. <coughs> the next day at dawn, we set off. Beauty beyond belief. Great white marble structures supported by indented columns. <coughs> My throat's a little dry, I guess. <coughs> this is really interesting. Beauty beyond be belief. Great white marble structures supported by indented columns. Statuses of courageous heroes, just kings, fair queens, and beautiful women. Streets of red and black cobblestones, fountains, manors, and villas, each one impressive. Uranios was a gem. Whatever disaster befell this city, whatever curses the gods lay upon this place, they left the city intact. The surrounding region is a hellscape, yet the city lies untouched save for the good bit of cracks and overgrown weeds. At the mouth of the cave lay a tunnel barred by an iron gate. At the moderate application of manpower, the gate yielded. We emerged from our new passageway atop an aqueduct. We crawled in through the outhouse, lovely. Unrestrained sunlight bore down through the city. The gods covet Uranus' beauty. They conceal it from us mortals, and to that end, they form a mountain around it and hide it and bore a hole through the top so that we may gaze. they may gaze down upon it from the heavens. We won. <coughs> we beat the swamp. We bested the relentless dead, and we have uncovered the ancient holy city of legend, which lay undisturbed for millennia. Treasure indeed was there to be had. Ancient weapons, relics and armor and bars of gold, jewels and coins. We slept on hammocks and ate crabs and frogs living by the aqueduct, all the while plunging further into the city. The last structure to explore was immense. It resembled the temple yet on the much grander scale identical to a palace. It was fashioned of the same white marble as every other grand structures and this was the grandest. Getting to this large temple would be a challenge. It resided on a man-made hill of solid block. Sole access to this temple is by a wide walkway some 200 paces long. <clears throat> that walkway lies destroyed 30 paces in. There lies nothing but a jagged rubble and sharp stone between the walkway and the temple. Our solution was a ladder constructed of rope and bed sheets. The wooden double doors are massive, twice the length of a man and thick as a tree trunk. Despite their age, did not, they did not yield to our party. We entered through a broken window. A flash. Sunlight? I've had this feeling before. The interior of the temple is un almost untouched, save for a thick layer of dust and wild grass that, where, of wild grass grew where bones there, bare stones lay, old faded murals and tapestries, finely carved idols and more dotted shells, and littered the corners of the temple. What a sight to behold! The main chamber stretches to the ceiling, but at the sides are the stairs leading to the balconies with rooms for other purposes. The central part of the temple was bare, save for faded grass, dust, and a few rugs, old faded and tattered. A drain curiously ran through the center. It, its source came from a raised platform reached by ascent by a few white by, by a few marble white steps. The ground floor must have been the central place of worship. They raised the, that raised platform had white marble table at its center, an altar. The prophet or holy man probably led their congregation in worship from that point. The faithful either sat or knelt on rugs. <clears throat> I paused. A pair of black eyes peered at us from beyond, beyond the stone staircase at the corners of the temple leading into the upper balconies. White fur? 
I couldn't see it clearly. It was dark and enveloped in shadow. A hound. It had a muzzle, but it was huge, far too big for it to be a hound. Its lips curled back and bared its jagged teeth at us. They were long fangs, crooked and bent and sharp. <coughs> a shrill sound escaped this throat. It sounded like the screaming of a woman, then almost instantly the scream was joined by a chorus of a dozen more voices. And then more voices. Um, until a chorus of a thousand souls screaming in agony and had to partake in the horrible screaming. The sound was unbearable. <coughs> my palms shot to my bleeding ears and I fell to my knees. <coughs> Holy fuck! <coughs> what the fuck? My got throat. the coof. You should get some I got water. the coof. <laughs> <coughs> I'm dying. Okay. Good, bro. Yeah, I'm good. I need to finish reading. <coughs> uh, and then more voices. Until a chorus of a thousand souls screaming and I had partake in the horrible screaming. The sound was unbearable. My palms shot from my bleeding ears and I fell to my knees. I felt sick. I could not stand. Spinning. Everything was spinning. The floor, the ceilings, my companions, me. I was, was I spinning too? One thousand souls continued to wail and screech. They were in pain. <clears throat> I felt an intense heat shoot past my head. The horrible screeching had ceased. A shrill ringing filled my ears. I tried desperately to compose myself. My ears rung and my eyes spun. I stood up despite all of that. I could see now. The creature was lit afire. It writhed and rolled and howled in the shadows. I saw Assam on one knee. <coughs> arms outstretched and... Arms outstretched, hands and fingers arranged in a magic sign. My eyes watered, my nose bled, my ears bled, and my gut felt like it was punched in by a giant. I shivered. I thought it was fear at first, but hairs were standing on end, and, but then I felt my heartbeat. <coughs> and, in the space of another heartbeat, there was a pause, then another pause. Only after those two pauses would my heart beat again. What did this thing do to me? I shivered uncontrollably despite the warmth of the day. The creature emerged from the shadows of the staircase. It stood on two legs. Long white fur sprouted all over it. Its forearms were bent in the manner of a mantis, and, just like the mantis, were bent in the horrible sickled shape of ivory claws. It was a giant. It was giant. It easily rose above the height of an elephant. The creature had to duck to avoid its head hitting the beams and the foundations of the temple. All the while it bared its horrible fangs on us and scanned each of us with its black eyes. I was frightened. My balance was off, my ears were still ringing, and the room hadn't completely stopped spinning yet. <coughs> I felt stick to my stomach, and so, I charged the creature with my sword. I sliced on its chins and heels on its hind legs and stabbed its abdomen. My sword made a shallow sound. Black blood burst out from the creature and poured over me. It smelled like rot. The creature hadn't reacted at all to its injuries. It reared back its sickles on its arms and flailed wildly at me. I retreated, it snarled and grunted and groaned. Its slobber spewed over the floors of the temple. Assam shot another fireball at the creature. Its white fur caught a fire, but it did not scream, nor did it react to the fire at all. Its white fur now burned. The smell was awful, like already rotted dead bodies being burned. The creature, on fire, charged to the rest of my party, limbs flailing wildly. <coughs> its mad thrashing undid the beams of the ceiling. Stone and dust crashed to the ground. I could not see. More of the roof started to fall. I had nothing to shield myself under. I guarded my help head and hoped for the best. It was dark. The sun was setting and the sky was orange. The roof of the temple had collapsed. Something had crashed down on me very hard. I felt spent. I could not move at all. I just tried to move... Move at all. I just tried to take in deep gulps of air. <coughs> My heartbeat was still slowed. Whatever curse was placed on me was still held strong. I heard a loud noise of rubble grating and shifting. The sound was followed by snarling. It survived. I bolted upright. Adrenaline coursed through my body. I could see it. White fur dyed black toward its legs. Its head was now brown from all the dust. The creature had one of its... Our companions snatched in its claws. It held him tightly with the bottom of its sickle-shaped blades. Gently, it brought him up to the face and sniffed him. Dead? Then it dropped him like a child lost interest in its toy. I felt around for my sword. It was lost. I dug desperately, quietly hoping to uncover it from the debris. I found Assam and another one of our companions. They took a deep breath as I unearthed them. Our white furred terror was digging. <clears throat> it had cleared the rubble from the altar and some of it from the drain. 
it was excavated the remaining pairs of our comrades. It excavated the remaining pairs of our comrades. I could hear them. Both of them were decidedly alive. Then I heard the sound similar to a butcher slicing a cut of ham from a pig. I looked. The creature had placed them on the altar, one above the other, and sliced their heads off. Their blood poured into the drain. We had to leave. The creature paid us no heed. It fell to its knees before the altar. <coughs> Stretched its bladed forms outward as if to hug the sky and howled. It howled and it howled again and again and again. We descended our rope ladder and hobbled hurriedly across the city. The creature continued ha to howl in the temple. Were my eyes playing tricks on me? Black shadows casted by nothing bobbled and danced across the streets and walls. The setting sun had dyed the white marble city orange, and the black shadows of non-existent people danced and weaved. All the shadows were heading to the temple where that thing, where whatever it was, continued to howl. We were almost out of the city. It was just to get out through the aqueduct now. We enter. It is not empty anymore. It is now filled with water. Wait, that's not water. It's, is it blood? I should have never have come to this damn place, this godforsaken swamp. Curse Rios, curse this city. May the earth upon may the earth upon up and swallow the city whole. May not a single soul venture to this place in a thousand years. I swear on my life I won't die here. We emerged from the aqueduct shrouded in darkness. The sun had set. <coughs> Quickly, we flee down the old stone road. I am freezing. I shiver in through the cold. My teeth are clattering, clacking as I run. I breathe hard. My lungs burn and my body aches all over. I yearn to stop. I can see a fire ahead in the distance. Maybe it's travelers. I will rest there. <coughs> a third companion collapses. I don't have the strength to assist them. I barely have the strength to save myself. I'm sorry, friend. I keep going. I ignore calls and desperate pleas and just focus on the light in the distance. I can still hear him calling. I slow down to a walk. I am beyond exhausted. I walk across the dried grass and head to, to the light. Then I stop. Where is Assam? I call out his name, but there is no response. I am alone, the sole survivor of our expedition into the lost city, into the lost holy city of Eurianos. The light is calling me now. It whispers my name. A flash out of the corner of my, of my eye. And another. And my name. Bright balls of fire surround me, dancing gently on the breeze at first and then vibrating and buzzing like an angry bee. There are of many changing hues of blue and green in every color, and I hear my name. They call out to me. I go to them. I will be safe there. I will finally be able to rest at the lights. <clears throat> I languish in my prison. I know my name. It's on the top of my tongue, but I just can't place it. I try to recall other names too, but... <clears throat> My mother, my father, my brothers, my companions, I grow desperate. Not knowing makes me restless. I know their names. Assam? I whisper. Assam. I know his name. It is the last name. I whisper his name every spare moment. In this pit of nothing, it is the only thing that soothes me. I feel time passing, impossible lengths of time. All the while I guarded that name, the last name I uttered. I keep it close to my chest. Assam. I see something. I hear something. Impossible. Has my mind finally been lost after all this time? No, no. It's mortals just like me. I could see them and I hear them. I feel them and I smell them. They're so close. <coughs> I hear a name. Hypatia. I become alive. I call out to Hypatia. I see her turn back. She hears me but doesn't see me. I call out again and again and again. Hypatia, Hypatia, Hypatia. I grow louder every time. Then I hear it. Something else murmured her name. Unlike me, not a mortal. Hypatia, it whispered. No, I won't let you take her. I dance and flash a brilliant blue. I use every fiber of my being to call her name to me. Hypatia, Hypatia, Hypatia. I'm screaming and now dancing and flashing. I must have her, not the others. She will be mine. Hypatia, 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 but some of the people are writing these fucking Iliads, dude. Yeah, what the fuck, guys? <laughs> what is up with this shit? Yeah, the fucking Iliad. Like, legit, like, mythos, right? Yeah. Dude, this opening paragraph, like, fucking... I feel that. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Dude, I fucking feel that, dude. Oh my god. Like, is this, like, uh... A place? Did you make this name up? 
There's no Google. There's no Google result. Dude, fish. This is really fucking cool. <laughs> says he, I got possessed by autism. <laughs> Dude, this was like legit, really interesting. <clears throat> Damn, like some kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Not a mythos or a myth or something. Um, it's a I'm trying to think of a word like, like a like a folk tale or like a fable, like a fable. <coughs> Or a saga, maybe? A saga, maybe that's the term? Like, just like Fable, some story you tell. Yeah, an epic. Yeah. Embrace autism, reject modernity. <laughs> True. Dude! It's fucking good! I was reading fast because it was interesting. I was like, what the fuck? He turned into one of those balls of light. That's funny. Damn. That's me. I'm nothing but a ball of light. Damn. Good shit. Good shit. I think fishes and ishis were my favorite so far. Okay. Uh, who's next, Amar? I need a piss. Chad, Alright. I, <coughs> I need to get something to drink, okay? Alright. Alright, alright, alright. Right.
夢を見るのが寂しいあなたの声が私の光になっただから歌を歌ってください夢を見るのが寂しいこの月夜が夜に探しあなたの翼が自由に舞い上がる夢を見るのが寂しいあなたの夢が見える前に Oh, Damar, are you back? Yep, I've been back.、Oh, okay. <clears throat> I forgot I deafened myself, so I was like, why isn't Damar saying anything? Oh, yeah, no, I'm here. Alright, cool. Alright, um. So I didn't know they put fucking Divinity on the Switch. Yeah, dude. It's on consoles.、Mm-hmm. I like the song, Inori. I think it's Inori. Prayer. <clears throat> Alright. <coughs> These have all been really interesting so far. All very different. Very interesting. Alright. Who are we reading next? I don't know. All these seem funny. Well, and Kido's and Bacon's look funny. Oh, wait, didn't, I read, didn't we read this one? Power music? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I want you to read a long one because I read a long one, and I think Bacon's is long. <laughs> sure. You cool with reading Bacon's? Sure, sure. All right. You throw that over. My throat needs a break. I have like a、yeah. cough drop type thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lozenge. Dude. We've consistently had like the same amount of viewers, I think, ever since we started. I think everyone's been sticking around, which is really neat. <clears throat> hey, Night City Cases, return to monkey. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, let me just make sure it's like on the screen proper. I don't want the sound. Oh, okay. To, I, like, see, I didn't have this. I couldn't see the、uh, stream. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are we good to go? Yeah, we're good. Alright. Lightning cracks through the night, heralding a storm in Night City. 
As the downpour begins, a police AV bearing the city police precinct number one insignia touches down near an old Japantown warehouse. The lights from megastructures in the distance, deeper in the city center, dance across the AV's chassis as the landing bay opens for the passengers to disembark. First descends an average-looking Caucasian man of six foot in height, <laughs> shaved head, black hair, rocking a five o'clock shadow without an inkling of external cyberware, wearing a city police precinct number one light armor jack uniform, bearing a badge of the right breast reading Agent J NCPD, and holding his <laughs> Mal- Malorian arms Decker heavy pistol. Second comes a tall man of Jermaine, <laughs> descend, standing at 6'9", with black, slick black hair, clean shaven, or in a ballistic weave lab coat. Is this, I think this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I don't know who the other one is, but I think this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Maybe. Uh, with a jacket short sleeves, revealing his augmented gorilla cyber <laughs> arms, denoted by black fingers and silver nails, with a Militech special series microwave attached to his belt. On his right, be- on his right breast rests a badge reading, Dr. Frederick Zoller, NCPD. Doctor. <laughs> the last one to leave the AV before it lifts off and leave is a man of Creole descent, bald, standing at the height someone called <coughs> King of Manlets, at 5'11", wearing a virtual virtuality goggle set, <laughs> bodyweight suit interface to the cyber deck, attached to his belt as a Danger Girl special Kawaii Killer heavy revolver, <laughs> and a small backpack, its top unzipped, revealing a miniature alligator wearing a tag around its neck reading Ever. On his right breast, another badge reading Gator Ghoul NCPD. These men are a part of Night City Police Department number one anti drug runner unit and are here on Intel that Maelstrom, a Night City booster gang whose calling card is cybered up members, which makes cyber psychosis a prevalent <coughs> issue in their ranks, is storing a large cache of drugs ready for distribution to this location. Oh, okay. I, I remember him mentioning something about this a while back. I think this was like uh, he was using. Something in the setting for a D and D where he was running the cyberpunk or I'd rather with oh. it. Oh. <clears throat> uh, as their squad checks their gear in the rainy night, Agent J tells his retina net runner colleague Gator Ghoul to see if the warehouse has an active net architecture so they can see what they can learn from it. Gator Ghoul activates the cyber deck and runs a scanner program to look for any access points in the area, finding that there is one back outside the warehouse connected to a vending machine. Agent J tells their netrunner that they're going to sneak inside and get a head count on their perps while he goes around the back to jack into their network. Gator Girl splits off the squad and makes his way to the back of the warehouse while Jay and Dr. Zoller head into the warehouse. Sip of water, sorry. Good. Keep that throat moist. <clears throat> um, when Gator Girl makes his way to the back of the warehouse, he spots the access point, a lone vending machine in a dark alley with a dumpster in front of the vending machine on the other wall of the alley. Gator takes his backpack off and tells little Ever to keep an eye out for anyone coming, as little guy bellows in acknowledgement, popping his head out of the top of his backpack. Gator gets next to the vending machine and wirelessly jacks into the access point. His virtuality goggles flare up and generate a wire mesh landscape over meat space, <laughs> with a monolith structure in the middle requiring a password for him to delve into the architecture. This password is child's play for Gator to crack as he mutters to himself, I'm in, once he breaks it. As Gator Gold descends further into the next level in the architecture, the Netscape changes into some sort of gladiatorial pit, and he hears a metallic voice repeating the same word, Charles LeBlanc, his real name. Unnerved by this, the Netrunner isn't quick enough to react to an ambush from the origin of the voice. He is attacked by a large metallic dog adorned with spikes with fire in its eyes, and Maw, it's a black ice hellhound. As the net beast tears into his virtual flesh, with a bite sharp shock, pain strikes at his brain. Gator Ghoul knows very well this black ice can kill him for real if he isn't careful. He loads his Banhammer program, resing in a blue maul for his virtual avatar to wield against this beast, and strikes at it, gravely wounding the ice, visibly derezzing its hind leg. I like that line a lot, visibly derezzing. And fucking like, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the Tron remake that they did. Uh-huh. They like blast into bits. They get fucking yeah, it's sick. Anyways, um, in that moment, right after striking the Hellhound, Gator hears a noise, not in the net, but in the meat space. A loud hissing coming from Eva. The warning from his little reptilian friend nearly came too late, as Gator Girl springs up and is met with a bat aimed directly at his face. He raises his arms to block the blow successfully, and thanks to his shock absorbent body weight suit, instead of having broken bones, he'll just have some nasty bruises. Now, if the booster stranger was his only problem, it wouldn't be an issue, but Gator Gold is still jacked into the system and currently dealing with black ice. As he pushes back his attacker, his virtuality goggles overlay the Hellhound on the Maelstrom booster, with Gator Mind going on a million miles an hour trying to figure out how to handle this shit situation. The booster ganger then screams out as he hears the snap of Gator Jaws bite down his left leg, 
Thank you, Weaver, Gator Ghoul exclaims as he uses his band hammer program to finish off the Hellhound, derezzing it completely, and then unholsters his Kawaii Killer to finish off the booster with a bullet straight through his Borg skull. Gator Ghoul picks up Eever and hugs him, telling him that's going to be good eating tonight, and for that assist, as he chews and coos like a baby gator would. He then places Eever back into his backpack and then delves into the next level of net architecture. On this level, he notices he's impossible. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Repeat. On this level, he notices that it's surrounded by impossibly high wireframe walls, denoting that this is as deep as the system goes, and sees in the middle of the Netscape file that he extracts and copies to his cyber deck so that he can decode it later. Gator Ghoul then ascends to the levels of the Netscape and safely jacks out of the system. As he does this, he starts to hear shouting and gunfire in the warehouse. Looks like they started the party without a Seaver, he tells his little companion, as he straps his backpack back on and starts to make his way back to the front of the warehouse to back up his team. Agent J and Dr. Zoller enter the warehouse through a side door next to the large bay doors in front of the empty warehouse into a sort of entry area you would see at a work office that was empty. They hear people milling about further in to what they assume would be the main storage room of the warehouse. They proceed forward stealthily into the room and see that the large storage room fills out most of the building's large space, with large storage crates strewn around the room, could provide ample cover if a firefight were to break out and a catwalk above with several stairs leading them to what seems to be a control room in the back, where the catwalk leads to. Most likely a head office room, and probably where the leader of the Maelstrom Brewsters would be hanging if the lawman were to guess. In the center of the storage base, standing in front of the hanging office room, a large crate standing at about chest height has four men cybered up with mechanical limbs and robotic eyes. Very, middle, very little meat is left of these boosters. All the men have weapons that look rather cheaply made, but still deadly. Two looking what have to be heavy pistols, one with a bat, and another with a submachine gun. Agent J and Dr. Zoller move closer to these men to get into earshot, but unseen to see if they can learn anything before Gator Ghouls comes back to his system before he delves into the network. Hey Chumba, how long have we gotta get uh, Hey Chumba, how long we gotta fuck around here watching the goods, says the ganger with the bat to the one with the submachine gun. However long it takes until the man upstairs gives the go ahead, he replies, using his thumb to point to the office room above them. But we've waited in here for fucking hours, man. I mean, what the fuck are we waiting here for? Johnny fucking Silverhand himself to come pick this shit up or something? The Batman retorts. Don't act like a gonk, idiot. We're getting paid to do real. We're getting paid real good to do nothing. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Chastises the gunman. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, well what is this stuff, anyways? Have you tried any of it? Questions the Batman. I like that his name's the Batman. <laughs> Apparently, it's some sort of new shit I, have, I ain't never heard of before. Boss call it RTM for Return to Monkey, some sort of hard stim that's supposed to make you more in tune with your instincts, whatever the fuck that means, <laughs> explains the gunman. Also, no, I haven't tried it yet. We're supposed to move this shit whenever the boss says to, and we ain't allowed to skim any of the score off the top. Yeah, I get it, but man, this shit must be worth it if we're fucking around here and watching it, exclaims the Batman. Yo, I'm gonna go out back and take a piss. Whatever, man, you do you, replies the gunman, and as the Batman leaves out the back door. Agent J and Doctor Zora look at each other and nod. Zoller moves around to the back of the shipping container where they are hiding and takes a couple steps back, pulls his right arm back, readying a haymaker. The servos on his gorilla arm wind up as he prepares. He takes a large stride forward and throws a punch at the container. The instant his knuckles meet the metal of the container, all the tension built up in his arms is released with a loud steam venting sound like making his cyber joints in his fist extend one inch, adding an insane amount of force to his strike, causing the container to slide forward at an incredible pace. What the fuck? The two one gun wheeling goons just say, moments before they were too late to react to the shipping container, now sliding into them, crushing them into the back wall of the room with a satisfying crunch and splat of metal and viscera. While the Maelstrom ganger holding the submachine gun is caught off guard by the sudden change in his surroundings, Agent J parts the booster from his body by shooting him in the head, effectively deleting his cranium with his decker. In a show of camaraderie, Agent J and Zoller give each other a high five, but is interrupted by the bellowing down from the catwalk. What in the fucking goddamn is going on here? Yells a large man from the catwalk, looking down at the two in the and mess they made. <laughs> this being looks to be standing at a possibly seven foot and can barely de described as looking human, with a ridiculous amount of board wear, making his body much look look more a mech than man, with only the head from his bottom jaw up it looking like flesh. You fucking badges trying to bag my score? Hell no, nah. I'm sending you both straight to hell myself. I don't need my fucking men when I got this shit, the Borg bellows, as he jabs an air hypo into the back of his neck. 
The Borg starts screaming. Dr. Zoller pulls out his microwaver and fibers at the Borg, expecting it to literally disable this man, as the weapon is designed to shut down Cyborg for a time with EMP charge rounds. As the round hits the Borg, electricity discharges around through his body as he goes limp, but a, sef- but a second after, he lifts his head and fire in his eye and saying, that shit ain't gonna work. His shoulders part way, revealing pop-up machine guns that begin to fire the tattoo, extending his arms, revealing mantis blades. The two lawmen dive behind cover of another shipping container to avoid the hail of fire from the Borg. Doctor, you mind telling me why your microwaver didn't work? Questioned Agent J. This freak shouldn't be able to move right with how much cyberware he's packing after taking a direct hit from that thing. I know I saw you hit him. I'm not entirely sure what's happening either. It should have worked, explained Dr. Zoller. I believe this had something to do with whatever he shot himself up with. Right after the good doctor and Jay's exchange, Gator Ghoul comes in and links back with his team. Looks like you two have looks like you two have your hands full with this guy, chides Gator Ghoul. Why don't you use a microwave on him, Doc? I did, Zoller snorts. Ha ha ha, I see I have three little piggies to cook, laughs the Borg. If you fucks are just gonna keep shitting yourselves, I'm coming after you. The Borg jumps down from the catwalk while his shoulder guns keep suppressive fire on the trio in their cover, and begins to sprint at their location at unprecedented speed. Three split up from cover behind Behind the cover, as Zoller punches the container at the Borg. The Borg vivisects the container, barreling towards him with his mantis blades, and comes face to face with Dr. Zoller. Gator Ghoul with Kawaii Killer readied, and Agent J with Decker readied, flank the Borg on both sides and take out his pop machine guns. The Borg groans in displeasure when he realizes his guns are now inoperable, and unable to turn this lab coat pig into Swiss cheese, then proceeds to strike at the Doctor with his mantis blades. The Doctor and the Borg are locked in melee combat while the other two lawmen try to get in shots when there's enough space between them, but never really hit anywhere meaningful to assist their partner. The Doctor can barely keep up with the Borg, and is constantly on defensive so he decides to take a gamble. When the Borg goes for the large swing on his right arm, the Doctor moves into space and to grab it and go for a shoulder toss. The Borg realizes what is happening halfway being tossed over his shoulders and reacts by extending the blades from his knuckles, revealing his wolvers. The Borg man may have just been tossed in a precarious situation, but it wasn't without its cost. During the action, he was able to move the Doctor's right arm with his Zollers, with his Wolvers that Zoller did not take into account to when he went for it. The two lawmen flanking the Borg unload their mags into the Borg now lying on the ground. Fuck, screamed Dr. Zoller. That fucking hurt. This is going to be a bitch to put back together. Gator Ghoul goes to check the crate the gangers are watching while Dr. Zoller patches up his stuff and collects his removed arm, and Agent J goes over to the Borg. You guys are shit out of luck, groans the Borg. Uh, J, we still have a problem calls Gator Ghoul, while Ever hisses at the contents of the crate. The crate, the crate is rigged with explosives. He <laughs> yeah, and those explosives are rigged to my bio monitor, the Borg says weakly as he gives off the death rattle. We gotta go now, yells Agent J as the trio bolt for the exit. Once they reach the front office area of the warehouse, they hear and feel an explosion coming from the storage bay that shakes the very foundation of the building. The three make it outside and see smoke billowing from the back of the warehouse. Agent J calls in HQ to send a cleanup crew to see if they can salvage anything from the rubble. He curses at himself since they came up empty-handed, even though they knew the thought where they were holding the new mysterious drug they came here for. Gator Ghoul puts his hand on Agent J's shoulder while Eve coos and tells him we still got something interesting. He tells him that he found an interesting file on the net architecture, but he can't crack it here and has to take it to a local fixer to see if we can get into the contents of it. The trio look up to the rainy midnight sky as sirens blare over several police AVs showing the load up to a scene flying past the larger AV for a split second, had a sheen on its side from a distant megastructure, lighting reading Militech. The good Dr. Zoller, his dismembered arm, right arm in his hand, Agent J standing in tension, Gator Ghoul petting his mini alligator Eva, all were saying, thinking the same thing, just another day in Night City. <laughs> Damn, pretty good. I like it. I like how everyone had pretty much equal uh, screen time. That's good. Yeah, I was a little confused at first what was happening, but then I realized it was like going chronologically back to like the other two and then what they were doing. Oh. And yeah. then like leading up to the guy meeting him. Yeah. Pretty interesting. <laughs> RTM, return to monkey. <laughs> Damn, he cracked up. You good, Bacon. You sent me like three copies. That's the third copy. He was still like, he had a draft and then a second draft and then the final version. Because he wasn't sure how to end it, but I guess that's how it is. Pretty good. All right. Who's next? Kind of want to read Neko Ultimas. Read Neko Ultimas. 
because it's weeaboo. Okay. <coughs> wait, wait, wait. Let me let me see how this is pronounced. <laughs> On. No. Mono. On mono. On mono. Okay. On mono, or in English, something genuine or real. In a scene from the popular light novel and anime series, Yahari Ore no Seishun Love Comedy wa Machigate Iru, the protagonist Hikigayama, Hikigaya Hachiman says he wants something genuine. But what is something genuine? A lot of people, when they hear the word genuine, might think of something like the difference between a fake piece of art and a real piece of art. But in this case, we will be talking about bonds between people. Interesting. So, what makes a bond genuine? Throughout our lives, we form all kinds of bonds, whether it's offline or online, friends, family, and even pets too. To some people, they might consider all their bonds genuine, but in the realest sense, are they really? For example, you're at your first day of school and you meet your classmates. You get along with a couple of them and maybe even hang out with some of them now and then. This goes on for years till you graduate and then you all go your separate ways. John, what do you want? I'm reading. You're on stream. Don't say anything racist. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, this goes on for a few years till you graduate and you all go your separate ways. You might still be in contact with a handful of them at this point, but most will probably fade out of your life eventually as you each have your own lives to live, and so the bond disappears. The same applies online. You join a community, make some friends, talk and play with each other, and then life catches up and bonds are lost. Can you really consider any of those bonds that simply lose to the trail of time genuine? <clears throat> this is like painful, right? Because I've had, I've known people like that too. Or I've had people like that too. Family bonds are more complicated. Whether you get along with your parents, kids, or not, there will always be a strong bond between parent and their offspring. Let's start further out in the family tree. If a distant relative that you may have went once or twice during a family gathering, let's say your aunt's husband's parents, passed away, how would that make you feel? You show up at the funeral, you put on a sad face and offer your condolences, but would you really feel a genuine sadness for the loss of this distant family bond? Probably not, considering if you've only met them once or twice. Family or not, that's still practically still strangers, right? Going back to the bond between parents and kids. They raised you for a good portion of your life, so you would have had countless daily interactions with them. Unless you really didn't get along with your parents, you should feel a genuine sadness if they pass away. But even so, this bond is something that you were born into and not something that you made for yourself. Can you really consider this bond a genuine one? So, going back to the original question. What makes a bond genuine? Is it the amount of time we spend with another? Is it the amount of affection we might have for someone? If even our bonds with our closest family cannot be cannot truly be considered genuine, then is there even such a thing as a genuine bond? A bond that's strong and pure. A bond that's irreplaceable and can never be broken. A bond that you can't put into words but can always feel. Can such a thing exist? I don't know. Even if such a thing does exist, how difficult and long would it take to find one? 100 lifetimes might not even be enough. Even so, I want something genuine. Damn. That's kinda heavy. That's actually really heavy. I'm surprised knowing knowing what I know about this person. They're always like posting emotes, but they're like, this is like the heaviest shit I've ever heard them say. Damn. Not even your parents and the friends and shit that you know from family. That's heavy, dude. Fucking heavy. Yeah. Where's Neko? Neko Ultima. Let's be, let's make a bond. All right. Fuck you. <laughs> I hate you and I'll bond with you. All right. What's next? We got Darai, Magical Egg, and Keto, Robbie Nilla, and Skyline, Fighting Rocks. Nilla? 
Damar, you want to read Nilla's work? Damar? I'm fidgeting on something one second. <clears throat> Damn. Yeah, there we go. What's left? Uh, four. Darai, magical egg. He's like an acquaintance of an acquaintance of an acquaintance. But okay. apparently he heard about this thing. So I was like, alright, whatever, send something in. And Keto, Nilla, and Skylines things. I'll read Justice's thing. Who? Just, uh, Skylines. Okay. I'll send it to you. I'm interested in reading his. He wanted some feedback on it. He said he had a lot of fun writing it. <clears throat> okay, so this one's called Fighting Rocks. Let's pick up some water here. Okay. It's difficult to imagine a world where you go out of your way to find the most difficult, grueling, and intense method of completing a task. And yet, that's a place I find myself losing hours at a time, cursing aloud the entire ordeal. Climbing is fucking stupid. The single most common phrase to come out of a climber's mouth especially if they've stuck with the sport for any meaningful length of time. How paradoxical, then, that I force myself and others like me might trade so much of our life for something that seemingly offers so little in return. Are we just retarded? A little bit, <laughs> yeah. But let's be honest, who isn't? It comes with the territory of being a member of our unique brand of monkey. Perhaps <laughs> that's why we do it. We're just monkey. So much of life is outside our control, and so many of our dreams seem impossibly far away. I think that's the allure, to be able to make the impossible possible, to be able to wrestle control from chaos. In a sense, to fuck the owner hole before it's even left the shop. <laughs> you make your own rules and find your own path, and no nigga is going to stop that. That's climbing. So much of life revolves around excuses, and where to place blame for events. Good luck blaming a rock for your stupid ass falling off of it. Really puts things into perspective. Even more so when you're 15 feet off the ground without a rope and you feel like your arms are going to explode. You get a real good sense of just how strong you are in those moments, both mentally and physically. When it all goes to shit, you have to choose. Let a literal rock beat you out or figure your shit out. I believe life is like that. I often think about the importance of mental fortitude. When someone is shot and bleeding to death, every fiber of their being is telling them to close their eyes and go to sleep. There's a decent chance that they may, might not, never, may not ever wake up again. Yet you often hear miraculous stories of survival. How much of this is luck, and how much of this is being strong enough of will to deny death's call? I hope to be that strong, and I think I get to test that resolve during every move on the rock. There are no excuses, and there's no one else to blame. It's just you and your willpower. Will you give up, or will you fight on? Corny as fuck, but nigga, it'd be like that, I swear. I don't think climbing <laughs> is the only sport or activity that offers this for people. That's part of what makes people so interesting. You can show 100 people the same random ink blot, and most will see their parents divorce, but some might see a dinosaur. <laughs> Others will see a better future, and some will see nothing at all. For myself, however, climbing is the most visceral connection I found myself to, I found to these parts of myself. And the best way to ask myself these questions about will and resolve. I want to be a better person, and I think climbing helps me challenge me in ways that I need to get there, eventually. It also looks cool as fuck, so that's a big plus. Passions are often nonsensical from the outside, and in that we have a thread of commonality, no matter what gets your dick hard. Regardless of what resonates with your soul and gets you schmoovin, that spark within ourselves I think is the essence of the human spirit, to see greater and more than what's in front of you. My passion is fighting rocks, so yeah, I guess that's also my source of autism. Thank you for reading. Damn, I like that's that. Cool. That's very passionate and like, like that's very sweet, positive, yeah. you know? Very hopeful, very introspective. Nice. I really like the idea that it's like, yeah, you, you got owned by a rock, dude. Like, yeah, yeah, putting it that way and putting it in like your it's perspective. An animate, it's an animate object. Like you you let this anything. fucking rock beat you, bro. You, you fell off that right. fucking... Oh, my God. <laughs> there were some good lines, too, like the own a whole thing. 
<laughs> Fuck in the old hole before you leave the shop. Bro, that was good. Very dense. Very condensed, too. Yeah, very sincere. That's a good way to put it. It's very, like, personal writing, too, you know? Yeah. Like, it's not, like, an emotion or a uh, fiction. It's very that person, you know? Right off the top, yeah. Yeah, right off the yeah, top. It definitely sounds Shield like justice. Like if you've, yeah, it definitely yeah. sounds like justice reading it. Hell yeah. Damn, I like that. That was good. Thanks, man. I can give you more detailed uh, introspection later. I think he was watching earlier. Or maybe he's off doing something else right now. All right, my turn. Me, you, me. All right. I kind of want to lay. I kind of want to leave Enkidos for last. Oh, nice! You're still here, dude. You're writing. Your piece was very good. I liked it a lot. Very interesting. Very, very soulful. Yeah. A lot of these have been extremely interesting. Yeah. All right. I think I'll read Magical Egg. The thing I don't like about this is that I think they already wrote it and they were just submitting it instead of writing it for this thing. We'll read it and see how interesting it is. Alright. And then I'll let you read Nilla's and then I'll read Enkido's. Sound good, Damar? Yeah, sounds good. Alright, thanks for helping me out with all this too. It's been... Yeah, no problem. It's gonna be about three hours. Holy shit. Oh, Bacon. Yours was really pretty well written, I think. Yeah, I liked it a lot. It was fun. It felt very felt very much felt like a level in fucking cyberpunk. Like, I could see myself going in the warehouse, trying to hack the thing, punching the crate and squishing a guy. <laughs> I wish there was more stuff with the return to monkey drug. <laughs> but maybe in the uh, sequel. Alright. <clears throat> I think this is like a fictional piece. Magical egg. The crack that shone at its smooth surface make me sat up with anticipation. This egg had been under the magical lamp for a week, but as the greatest witch of our little village say it, there's no, there's no a set instruction on how to hatch a magical egg. Anyone that wants to hatch a magical egg could only buy the expensive magical lamp and a few bag of magical ore that cost at least 50 gold and pray for the best. I don't think English is their first language, so it's a little haphazard translation. And since she is the greatest witch, whatever she said must be true. I parted te tearfully with my hard-earned gold coin, which I had been saving up to move out of this frontier village, to give the extra egg to give the egg extra cares that not even our village bell would taste. <coughs> It's true that there's an option to sell it to those weird adventurers, but somehow I feel reluctant to do so. And no, I'm not doing so because of the, that lovely Belle had been egging me, saying how extremely improbable it is for anyone but her to catch a legendary mythical creature. Pa, the girl wasn't lucky enough to get a magical egg shouldn't talk big. The crack widened, but nothing popped out of the egg yet. I bit my lip nervously. A dragon or phoenix would be great, but at the same time, troublesome. Maybe it's time for my old dream to be a hero to come to come true? Wait, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Poking my finger to the surface beside the magical lamp, I sighed aloud. Even an elemental gecko would be great. I mean, it was one of the most common beasts that would hatch from a magical egg. So, having one would be okay, I guess? Another crack and something yellow eventually emerged from the cracked egg. My excitement to light natured magical beast died down as soon as it came, when it finally raised its head. What? Absent mindedly, I clamped the creature in my hand and brought them, with its eggshell and all, to our greatest witch's shack. I, need an ex I needed an explanation urgently. The witch had been peering inside the cauldron and jumped out, almost falling into the said cauldron when I opened her workshop with a bang. She almost turns into some terrifying ghoul when I shoved the beast in my hand. It doesn't look like anything magical into her face. Thanks, she said with a raised eyebrow. If this is an offering, I prefer a grown one, though. The said chicken screeched, attacking the witch that scrutinized it quizzically. Oh wait, this is your magical beast? Asked the witch, picking the eggshell while definitely dodging the yellow beast's attack. I nod before opening my mouth to ask how is that even possible. Why my precious magical egg hatched such an ordinary animal. But the door opened loudly. 
drawing our lovely, arrogant bell in sight. Whoa, a chicken, the bell said, zooming into the room. Fitting beast for a coward, eh? Feeling insults in a word, the creature in my hand jumped and attacked the bell with vigor. Huh. I guess a chicken wasn't that bad. At least it could help me fight an annoyance. A light-natured chicken, said the witch, picking the creature that jumped in my hand. After chasing off the bell, she scrutinized it for a while, before securing a promise from me to report the chicken development from time to time. And what choice have I other than to nod and agree? She more than capable to snatch Chucky, the chick, out of my hand, after all. Huh. It's just a chicken. How's the egg magical? As magical as you want it to be. Is that the story? I'm sure th something's been lost in the translation. Okay, I, yeah, I mentioned that bacon earlier. I figured it was... Um... Oh shit, sorry. Did my uh, connection die? Oh, oh no, you're still here. Hello? Okay, okay. What's cool. up? No, no, I thought my, my shit cut out for a second, so I thought it died. I think they're Indonesian, this person. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know them very well. All right, I'll send you Nilla's. Magical Alm. Be Jewish. No, don't do my girl like this. Don't do her like this. What? Yummy Duka. You read this. You wrote this in like an hour, I think, right? <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to read this, buddy? This is pretty bloody core. What is it? Yeah. Go ahead and read it. Read it. I dare you. Dare me? This isn't much of a dare. I'll read it. Give me a second. Uh, and paste it into Google. It's just text. How can it hurt us? I just have to space it. Let's see the inner workings of Nilla's perverted mind. Joshi Yamiduka. The moon is piercing through its dreary black surroundings, a white dot shooting through a swirled gray-blue hues, glaring, begging for attention. But the full moon was the least of my concerns. To me, this white rock only served one purpose, to shine light, perfectly framing his stark, pale white jaw, to accentuate his beautiful hands, how his knuckles and tendons popped through his almost transparent skin, Blue thunderbolts of veins striking across them. The moonlight glistens beautifully off of his fingernails, sharp and red, stained with blood. Allows me to see him striding over and stumbling next to me in this public bench. Now his open skirt, his oh, open shirt, Jesus Christ! Wow. Uh, his open how his open shirt allows anyone to see his toned stomach and undone pants, barely <laughs> clinging to his cut hips. Dotting white accents to the top of his thick jet black hair, cascading down his shoulders. The humidity giving it a beastly silhouette. Puffing up, threatening, acting as a cat would to ward others off, but not me. Ignoring the many warning signs, I stupidly jumped into his embrace. He's a horrible sweet talker, the breath of stinking alcohol and tin. But the arm over my shoulder was too enticing. When I ignore the cold, bony claws digging into my shoulder, away from society where no one would hear a thing, he mutters into my exposed skin, swiftly sinking his teeth into the crook of my neck. God, what the fuck is this? Spat Michael Rowe Valdemyong as he read the computer screen shining white on his face. Interested, he makes himself alone at home, sitting in the desk belonging to somebody, some nobody high school girl. Her coarse lays limp in the corner of the room, completely dry of blood. Her pale skin turning slightly blue, brown hair, done up in two pointed tails on the sides of her heads, hanging dull over her shoulders, bunching up at her broken neck. Her yellow sweater vest stained crimson as well under her white shirt. Roa was very sure to look up the rest before it stained her blue skirt, though. Yup, a real nobody. Probably routeless, too. Licking his lips, he grabs the mouse, shaking it before the screen has a chance to switch to his screensaver. He moves the cursor over to the note tap, notepad tab in her start menu, seeing the titles of many literary, many other literary strokes of genius the girls concocted. Sexy Vampire Lovemaking .txt, Sephiroth Lemon .txt, Dear Lord Anal Gape Seba Ciel. What the fuck does Ciel even have to do with all of this? Enticed by the fanfiction's title alone, Roa clicks the file and skims it feverishly, waiting for any mentions of his beloved rebellious daughter, not even realizing that the corpse he left it behind was starting to breathe once more. Sebastian, stop it. Ki Kia. Sebastian ran his gloved digits down Ciel's naked belly, pink and white like a peach. Master, 
I need to do this. <laughs> Their hips slam together, hard but also soft and gentle. Sebastian still wore his fancy black suit. Breathing weakly through her nose, Satsuki the anomaly felt an incredible throbbing pain in her neck. Where was she? The scent of blood tore through her nose, the strong metallic scent snapping her back to reality instantly with a loud shriek. She darted up, heaving deeply, her entire chest throbbing with each breath. This wasn't just any blood. She realized when she put fingers to her torn to open neck, it was hers. This is, oh god, this is my blood. Roa snapped back, his lips stained red from Satsuki's blood. He watched as she not only regained full consciousness, but was able to instantly heal her own wounds. That wasn't supposed to happen. Are you reading my fix? Ro weighed his options and decided that even with his burst of energy from draining this girl dry, he did not want to deal with a dead apostle anomaly right now and darted out from whence he came through a pride open window. <laughs> I need to do this. <laughs> Damn. I want to Google Sephiroth Lemon. That sounds that. cursed. That's, like, sounds extremely cursed. Another, uh, a Sephiroth times reader lemon something. Also, I can't, I can't endorse this on the premise that they badmouth uh, my girl alone. Yummy Duka. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> Pretty funny. All right. All right, and Kidos. Let's see what this is about. All right. <laughs> I saw the last line. <laughs> oh okay, you ready? Ready? All right, this is Enkido's thing. Bruddy, brubby fanpick Quan and Tong Wick featuring furries. Dot. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> It was a dark and stormy night in Virginia. The kind of day that makes you want to stay inside and watch VTubers and trick yourself to sleep while shitposting in your favorite discords. But instead, myself and my good friend Blighty were hitting the shooting range. We were paying the range master at the front counter when he notices something about me. Nice cock, you got there. He mumbles through his Trump maga mask. What? Was the only response I could give. Blake glares down at my crotch as if to confirm the statement when the Rage Master pulls down his mask. Nice Glock, I said. Damn muzzle makes it so no one understands me. Oh, yeah, thanks. Haha, uh -huh, Glock perfection, am I right? I stammer out to him, wishing he wouldn't have said anything to me. We grab our paper targets, black silhouettes with durags on, holding their newest release copies. <laughs> Of Hall of Summer 2 by Tamara, the best realistic depiction of dangerous urban youth available, and take our lanes. I take out my Glock 19, and Bloody takes out his newly purchased Sig P32 X frame as he was pardoned from being a felon for wiping enough asses at work. It was only a matter of minutes before the two of us were hitting perfect 10 scores at 50 yards with only pistols after watching some Hickok 45 videos. We used up our targets and decided to chill for a minute before we were leaving. Hey, want to see some of the new butthole pics I have, Bloody Sons 3? Jesus, you have more now? Alright, let me check them out. Here's your meat- Here's meat puck, this is Wendy! <laughs> Fucking Christ, it's like looking at a rainforest, why did you pay for this? Here's Jo- And before Bloody could finish, the range door bursts open and in, and in all, all his manlet glory stands, Danmo cropped up in a fresh supreme drip. What the fuck, did you invite Danmo? Bloody says disgusted. Nah, I didn't know he was coming. I saw walking up to Danvo when the range master busts in behind him. Hey, you have to pay first, fucker. Suddenly the range master is cut in half and falls to the floor. It's then we noticed that it wasn't our usual Danvo, and that he had his hand on his chin and his stupid green robot face is in full display. Holy shit, it's Robo Danvo. Robobo? Danbot? I wonder which stupid name would be the best. You are both wanted dead for crimes against humanity, says Robo Bitch. The fuck we didn't do shit, Bloody starts to say until he realizes, until he raises his hand with two external drives. Does cute and funny mean anything to you? Me and Bloody knowingly look at each other and nod. We dolphin dive past the range barrier as Danbot shoots a laser down the hallway, nearing, nearly missing us. Bloody runs down until he gets parallel to Danbot and I peek out to lay down distraction fire. Danbot fire takes the bait and focuses on me while Bloody slides back under, tripping Danbot on the floor and taking two shots, sending gears and oil flying into the walls and floor. Good thing we had watched John Wick last week, I mentioned as we recovered the external drives from the slain Supreme Bot. Heh, this wasn't even close to the worst I have anyways, Bloody chuckled so unconcerningly. 
We start exiting as we make our way to the front edges. We see at least 10 Robo Danbos helicoptering down. Okay, this is bullshit. What the fuck is this shit? I say as I look over to Bloody, who seems excited. What a great day. I get to shoot Tanbo even more. We raid the range for the ammo and tactical operator vests. Many kick groins and judo flips later, we managed to fend off the Robo Danbo attack. I should have just stayed home and watched VTubers. This sucks, I say, and Bloody looks back at me. I don't know what you were talking about. I'm gaming right now. <laughs> We get ready to leave when we see an army of at least 100 more Robobos marching toward us. Alright, now we are fucked for sure, I say as we are out of ammo to steal from the range. Don't worry, I sent out a message. They should be here soon. Suddenly the army of Robobos begin getting blasted to pieces as they all yell. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Who the hell did you call? I ask as a tank rolled up covers in furry stickers and imprinted with the RCFF standing for Royal Canuck Furry Forces. Exiting from the top of the tank is the super spook agent Tamar and Alto, fully doned with cowboy attire and assless chaps. Y'all gonna just <laughs> Y'all gonna just pass by without saying howdy? I shake my head wondering how the fuck it got to this point and we both get in the tank. We drive off into the rising dawn, the day saved. You guys should really check out Bloody's new asshole pics, they are pretty insane. The end. <laughs> Y'all gonna pass by without saying howdy. Bro, Damar. Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is like, like full of there's a lot more. there's like yeah, this is like there's there's probably a lot of like missing context for like a lot there's like a lot of silly like shit here. Like, like in the John the John lore. the John Wick thing, we literally like yeah, we streamed John Wick like last week and like there's a yeah. <laughs> really nice cock, bro. Oh my god. That was good. That was really good. good job, I don't know if it picked up the clapping, but I clapped. Damn. Alright. Let's talk about the entries. <laughs> that one was really uh -huh. good. Alright. So. Um. Let me see here. Thank you everyone for sending in your stuff. This was all so interesting to read. There was like not a single boring entry. Yeah, I did good. this thing because I was bored and I was like, you know what? Writing is something everyone can do. If they're on Discord, they know how to read and write. So let's fucking... Um, let's uh, writing thing. try to provoke people into writing something interesting, you know? I put up some money and uh, interesting we got interesting we got a lot of interesting entries some in jokes some fantasy stuff some fiction non-fiction analytical essays talk straight from the heart um all right you want to go through one by one and just give thoughts again closing statements or do you just want to it's been a while very your call i doesn't matter to me either way. Yeah, Nella, there's money in this. Guess how much money? Too much money. <laughs> I have the picture somewhere. I think I deleted it. Yeah, I did. A, I deleted on the it. pins? Uh, I think so. I, I thought you posted it in there. That's I think I did. Alright, let me pull it up on stream. I think I took another screenshot of it. Let me minimize this. No, I don't. I don't see it in there. I got it. I got it. <clears throat> so whoever won this contest would win a uh, thousand USD, either through Amazon or PayPal. Uh, that was you, the you and me. Elto wrote up in the uh, Gay Canuck Furry Force something in uh, cowboy hats and assless chaps. Yeah, we, we saved, saved the, day the day from from the Dan bots. <laughs> 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 all right so all right top three damar what are your top three um it's too late to lower I, you, now. That, you can't you can't make you can't make me pick dude i can't pick three i i, no. I like i honestly really like them all a lot for different reasons yeah, yeah. um because like 
the thing is the pieces are all really different like there's there's like creative mm -hmm. writing pieces and there and there's some more like out, like personal essay type stuff right so like yeah i i wouldn't really like directly like, i don't know compare any of them and i, I don't want to like sound like oh fuck centrist like pussy half-ass like mm -hmm. i really liked all of them a lot um there was particular yeah, bits reason. there was like particular bits in each that like i think was the big thing that, that like really stood out to me like even yeah. like the ones that were like kind of like shit posty like they're all like mm -hmm. still really funny and had like little touches and i don't know kind of they were sense. very creative yeah very creative uh even the shit posty ones they were a lot of fun elto's was yeah. interesting right all yeah. right let's go down to this bacon very interesting setup bingus very from the heart magical egg a little confusing. I think something was left out of uh, the Lost translation. Lost in translation, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Power of Music, very good. Very, um... It's a very personal piece. You think it's, like, a very broad topic? But it was a very, um, personal reason about what music does to, uh, death. Yeah. Uh, Princess of the Coom, pretty silly. <laughs> pretty well written, I'd say, without being vulgar. Elto's piece was, um... Uh, it was good. Alto's it was a good manifesto. guide. It was actually pretty interesting. <laughs> the guide part was, yeah, the guide part was interesting. Yeah, like the, the part, part about the drinking and the cigars, that was good. Bloody fanfic was like, this the, was uh... too personal. This, like, hit too many <laughs> buttons. It was so good. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense to any other person, you know? Yeah. Oh my god. Monster. This was good. That one was really good, yeah. It, this, this was like some fantasy story set up. And like the ending and the beginning, extremely heavy. Like this, and then the part where you realize he become a blue ball. Very good. Turn into an orb. Fresh, that was the first one we read. Very well written setup. It was very tense. And then he was like, I'm gonna drink the thing. And I was like, oh shit, what's gonna happen? So I kept reading faster. It was very, very interesting to read. Stars. Yeah, I have a socially distanced kiss stars this was extremely interesting to me i was talking with them and apparently they like they just know a bit about um astrology and stars and they put together a story oh. while um uh seeing like you know okay. the bit about the dog like apparently there's like some dog thing but it's not necessarily named pup or whatever yeah you know? interesting That's very interesting cool. yeah yeah it seemed uh, like it was like researched or like like it felt like they had a lot of background info on what they were yeah yeah like not, they knew what they're like, writing yeah like it seems yeah. like they had an idea for like the universe ahead of time with that one yeah yeah oh, no, no no pun intended but like what they wanted to do with it, rather. <laughs> bathroom this one was like i really super like tense lot, for dude. me yeah like it like accurately portrays anxiety and like the rumination you go through when trying to sleep and there's like an empty room next to you and you're not entirely sure what's in that room you know it's just me when i'm orbin like yeah up. yeah and that felt very my close door and like and the alarm clock sounds and it's like oh fuck we gotta we gotta go do stuff cahoots was mat. really funny yeah cahoots was like schizophrenic <laughs> extremely interesting tomorrow i must buy lettuce <laughs> cahoots damn that was good Nako ultima this was fucking heavy it's like yeah Bonds with your friends, family? Yo, is that is that genuine enough? Nah, fuck you. That's what it's saying. Nilla's was interesting. If you had more time to write it, I think you would have had something really good. And then I like Skylines a lot. That was very from the heart. Yeah. Right? Talking about climbing in Slam an poetry. interesting, e climbing. easy to Wait. understand way, you know? Rocks. Bum, 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 bum. So that's what I think the top three are for me. Skyline, Stars, and Bathroom. Damn, I can't pick one though. The real prize is the writing we learned. No, there's also the money the we experience earned. experience we shared. I should have split it into like top three or at least like... You know? Fuck. A thousand fucking dollars to one person. That might be a lot. Ah, oh, damn. I want to stick to my word, though. But these three are, like, just so 
That's what I was thinking. Yeah, split it three ways. ways. All right. 333 for each. How about that? Damn. Yeah. I'll talk more about each of these. Like, bathroom. Very anxious. Very... Like, English... You had to translate this? That's bullshit. Because this was... This read very smoothly. Very interestingly. The wording, very good. That was very good. Well, it was there was a line here that really hit me hard. It felt like the thing is like it felt like very like neurotic, right? Like the perspective. Yeah, the yeah, like, like, like it felt yeah. like a fucking tweaker or something like that. Uh, like this is what I'm going through, you know, like yeah. fucking neurotic, out of my mind, trying to sleep in bed, getting uncomfortable. Yeah, I totally feel that. Totally feel it. Um, skylines, dude, this was like real, like like. He was saying that he writes a lot of um, formal writing and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't speak Spanish though. I can't do anything with the Spanish one. But um, Dineline was saying like, yeah, it's hard for me to write in like a personal manner. You know? It feels very personal though. Like, it, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, he like he got it across. Like, gotta, he, like, like, it, like, when I was reading this, like, I, I could like hear justice like reading out to me i don't know it's very funny like it's just the the prose mm -hmm. in general is very like a lot of his mannerisms and stuff like that yeah 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 for right. sure it was very like like a uh, heartfelt explanation of why he likes this one particular activity or what it, like gives him yeah right yeah and about like it's a very In what's the word? Intensive, well, like, intensive. Well, you know, so like the other thing too is like uh, I don't know if you know, but he when he got married, uh, they did like a little climbing thingy, and then he yeah proposed to his uh, then fiance there. Mm -hmm. I remember so, like, that. And then he got like a huge ass fucking. He has a huge like I don't know if he put it away for you. Still have it outside for winter, I'm assuming. But, like he has like a huge ass climbing wall in his backyard. Oh shit. Yeah, very passionate about fighting rocks. I like the way he puts it and explains it. Damn. Passions are often non cyclical on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally feel that. But I can understand your passion here. The way you explained it here, I totally get it. And it's more than just a passion. It's like, it feels like fucking purpose, you know? Like a guiding... A guiding uh, principle, you know, like overcome this inanimate object and fucking struggle and overcome yourself and your barriers and stuff. I like that a lot. This one, Ishii's Orion Sisters. I was like, legit, I was like, is this from a book? Because this sounds like, like an actual like fucking fantasy, piece of fiction, yeah, like right? Yeah. God damn. God damn, this was really good. Like, I legit thought this was like taken from something, but then I tried like looking up some terms and it's like slightly different. I think they combined pieces of astrology from different parts of stuff and put it all together. Yeah, like it feels like a revisioning of like because like names and stuff or like mm -hmm. they look familiar. And it was written in such yeah. a way that it was like very concise, you know, like it's, how yeah, mythos. The thing is too, like the language that was mm -hmm. used also, I felt like also contributed. Like it felt very like fantasy, like I don't know, like the the prose and again like uh, felt very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very... Damn, this was really good. I liked it a lot. One day meet his friends. And then it comes back to like the stars in the sky, right? And then just like, well, like connecting it to the uh, mythos. What's, what's going on over there? You know what's fucking yeah. crazy is like, you could take. I, I remember talking about this event once. We were outside. It was when uh, the meteor shower was happening this year in like summer. Mm -hmm. um, we were sitting outside and like, I remember reading some of it. It's like, you, they could, like, the second you're born, they could put you in the fastest vehicle known to man and like, launch you like any fucking observable star and you would like you could live your entire life like 100 years and you still wouldn't make it to it which yeah. is like fucked up to think about yeah the scale of it. 
yeah the lifetime and it's still fucking so far all right Do, should i split it four ways there's another one i really like this one monster this was oh, like who's are saying live in the john bowman who's are saying live in the john bowman <laughs> Really you can't bad. vote for yourself. He said money oh, division dude. is in the John Bowman, so he said just leave it, live in the John Bowman. This was really good too. It was yeah. kind of long, right? But it was very the setting, Again, like meticulously detailed, and yeah. Yes, yes. I was like, I had to Google. I was like, is this city like a fucking real place? And it's just some made up term. They just it's a it's a placeholder name. Damn. It's like completely original. Okay, I'm splitting it four ways. Fuck, dude. They were all so good. I thought there'd be like a few bullshit ones, a lot of shit posts, right? Yeah. Maybe some people just like input the same word 500 times as a joke. But all of these are legit really fucking good. It was really good. I thought I could have sworn I was like, "This is so well written." This is this the actual mythos of the fucking series, dude. It was it was a really good job. Okay, I'm splitting it four ways. Uh, there's a thousand. So what? Two fifty each. Yeah, two fifty. Yeah. Oh, your dice and Minos. Okay, okay, okay. Your okay, okay. That's why it looks familiar. It it sounded like a real fucking term. Yeah, congratulations, guys. Like, honestly, again, congrats. congrats all the entrants. Like, they're all really good. Uh, Thanks for participating. Well, I should do this again yeah. sometime, maybe with a more reasonable uh, payout. But I enjoyed reading everyone's entries. These stood out to me the most, though, both in technical writing and stylistically and in content. Very, very interesting. All right. Um, I think I gave the Amazon card to myself. If I accept it, could I use it to get 250? I have no idea. Actually, I don't know if everyone's American, even. So I might need to Shit. PayPal some of the stuff. All right. Good job, guys. Congrats. Yeah, congrats. Ishii, George, again. Skyline, Fish. Congrats. Thank you so much for joining. I'm glad everyone, uh, everyone seemed to enjoy the readings. <laughs> It's good to have a motivator. I think we had like, we were hovering around 17 people watching the 18. whole time. Yeah, it was like 17, 18. So I think most people have stayed the entirety of the three hours. Yeah. Very interesting, very interesting. Yeah. It's hard to like, get motivated without some external thing, you know? Yeah, I can upload these somewhere. It's been three hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Nilla. I only posted it in discords that I'm pretty uh, active in. Instead of like Melty Cord or anything. But yeah, extremely, extremely interesting. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. This was money well spent. Maybe next time have we'll have a uh, more of a limitation or like a theme or challenge to it. But, uh, yeah, extremely, extremely fun. Too. Yeah, categories or something. Yeah. All right, we'll stop here. Thanks for coming, Damar. Thanks for helping me read. If I had to read all these entries, my throat would be, like, fucking dead. <laughs> all right, time to play some video games. All right, I'll hand out the, uh... I'll hand out the, uh, what do you call it, the prizes as soon as I can, as soon as I get off. Alright, thank you, bye-bye.